Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome all members and guests to the May 2nd, 2023 special council meeting and remind everyone that our meetings are web streamed and televised. Please ensure your phones are on silent mode. With that, I'd like to call the May 2nd, 2023 special council meeting to order. We have received regret regrets from Councillor Michelli and Councillor Duffy for this portion of today's uh, meetings. I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Moved by Councillor Van Andrieshi, seconded by Councillor Columbus. All in favor? Carried. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. We have one closed item of business today. I'm looking for a motion to enter into closed session at 1.04 p.m. to discuss a litigation matter pursuant to section 239.2 F of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended as the subject matter pertains to the advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that uh, purpose. Moved by Councillor Huffman, seconded by Councillor uh, Van Passen. All in favor? Carried. Okay. Welcome to Passionate Folks, a blog and video series about people who live in Norfolk. People that get involved in our community, people that are passionate about living here. We sit down, have a conversation, and learn about their stories. Welcome to Passionate Folks. I am Emily. I love to connect with people. I love to ask questions and get to know people better. So today I'm sitting here with Scott. Hey. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Uh, so Scott, to start, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself, who you are, where you're from, and where you live? Um, my name is Scott McCray. I am a chef here in Norfolk County. I'm the chef at David's Restaurant in town, and I live in Port Dover, or just outside. And yeah, all my family is from Port Dover. I moved here in high school and left for a bit and moved back, and now made it, I your home. Made it my home. Yeah, it was my home before. I realized it was my home while I was away, and yeah. Came back to the room. Yes, exactly. Uh, so, as I do with every guest, I ask you to pick a place in Norfolk County for us to do this interview. Mm -hmm. So, tell me where you invited me and why you picked this place. Um, well, we're here at Matt's Fruit Barn, just outside of town, and um, it was a pretty easy choice. I know we wanted something that was kind of related to what I do. We were always talking about how diverse uh, Norfolk County is as far as things that grow here. and. It's like number one for so many different fruits and vegetables. And one of the first things I always think about is just, especially considering what job I have is, is food. Norfolk County produces so much food and grows so much food. This, this property here that, that, that Christine and Jess and the family have kind of, they grow more things here than I can even think of. Like you look it's around. Like a representation you might... of Ontario's garden. When exactly. You visit this place, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of just like a little, a little, example of of what this area has to offer mm -hmm. so i love to dig in people's passion and and see what lights them up and i'd love to know about you i think i may have a little bit of an idea but yeah. <laughs> what, what are you most passionate about that's a tough one i think definitely I, i'm passionate about what about food and what i do that's something that since i was young i've always associated memories like a lot of people with songs or with like smells or things they will just trigger a memory and a lot of my early childhood memories have to do with food there'll be a weird little thing that i remember like oh that was my first like black olive i ever had or that was like there's a lot of memories that kind of are associated with that big connections to food big ones and yeah and like, like the mulberry tree in my grandparents backyard and we just stand for hours underneath just like eating mulberries and so I know you work long hours. Uh, it's a busy season for you in the restaurant. Uh, when you have some downtime, where do you like to go in Norfolk? Where, where do you like to have a good time? Um, well, I'm lucky that all my family 
lives here. I, I moved away for a while, I moved to the city, I moved, I was in the Yukon for a bit. Just being back and being able to see family is, is I don't get to see them enough still, but um, it, it's, it's definitely a big reason why I came back and something I like to do. Um, friends too, you know, just hanging out on local patios or at their house or watching lease games or... Well, I've always been kind of, for my grandma when I was a kid, I got really into like birds. Yeah, so I mean, there's binoculars in the truck right now. <laughs> it's a bird book. Did you go to Long Point or what? Oh, Long, well, of course, like that's um, Long Point. Uh, well, around here, like, I'm lucky I live out of town. You can drive out and see the tundra swans at Long Point when they come through. There's, it, it's really a mecca for that if you're into that. I'm a bit of a weird, obsessive record collector, and I've got a, a lot of records. <laughs> Do you like to see live music around? Is, that, is oh, there of course. decent bands that are around that you like to? Oh, tons. Yeah, yeah. It is, yeah, it's great. I mean, like a lot of my friends are. Um, are, are musicians and there's not a ton of downtown downtime but when there is it's like uh, sometimes just things that are just nice and relaxing it always helps when you have like a local brewery <laughs> and there's <laughs> a lot of big frogs, so. yeah there's a lot there's a lot of great ones it's really exploded especially since I moved back from Toronto about 10 years ago and even in that time it's um, the wine scene the beer scene the, the ciders like all that has just exploded and um, and it's all really good like do you think, like, just back to the the winery and the brewery, like, you know, uh, you know, after high school and when you wanted to leave and, and get to the city and and get out of here and, and coming back and finding it like right here? Well, even when I originally moved back, I was intended on going back to the city, and I came back and just realized that this is where I wanted to be. This is um, this is where my heart is. This is where I I really belong. And uh, and and there's, I have friends there, but the friends that I have here, are friends I've had since I was high school right so there's there's something there where there's a yeah well, we live in a pretty cool place yeah it's great <laughs> i thank you so much for your time i, I love thank connecting you. with you and then learning about your passions so appreciate it. well thank you very yeah. much you think <laughs> <laughs>
and then I moved on to production supervisor for the last seven. One of the best parts about working here is it is a build to order shop. So although we do make similar products every day, it's very unique. We don't always see the same orders. There's always new challenges. One of the best parts about being in manufacturing for me is the uh, ship work. So it provides an opportunity for you to adjust to do your own life on your days off or you can pursue other interests. A lot of people have uh, second businesses or hobbies that they really enjoy. There is lots of opportunity to advance. Uh, there's educational assistance programs. You can continue to learn new skills and advance to a new area if you were so desired. There's a great opportunity moving up the manufacturing sector. Try it because you're going to learn a lot about the working world as well as yourself. Welcome to Passionate Folks, a blog and video series where I'll be highlighting people from Norfolk County who have a passion, who are involved in our community, who are the movers and shakers. So I'm excited to introduce every month somebody new from Norfolk that will bring you their story, their passion, and share it all with us. Come on in. All right, welcome to the first episode of Passionate Folks. I'm Emily, and I love to dig in people's life and getting to know more about them. I'm here with Jess today. Thanks, Jess, for showing up. Thank you for having me. It's yes. so exciting. Uh, so just for the people that don't know you, introduce yourself. Tell me a little bit more about you and the person that you are. Sure. Um, well, my name's Jess, and I grew up in Waterford, more specifically Boston, more specifically Bill's Corners. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a passionate Norfolk advocate. I love this area. I love theater. I love music. I love anything arts related. I'm um, also a passionate advocate for entrepreneurs in the area. Uh, so I invite you to pick a location in Norfolk that meant something to you. Uh, so tell us where we are and why you picked this place. All right, we are here in Simcoe Little Theater. Um, it's on Tal the corner, corner of Talbot and Young in downtown Simcoe. And this place, Simcoe Little Theater, is a very special place to me. I spent most of my life in these walls, um, on that stage, behind the stage, in these seats, like everywhere in this space. Um, it's something that theater is something that's like a big, has always been a big part of my life since I was about eight years old. Um, you mentioned to me that you also in high school, you were really involved into the drama program and all that, so. I had walked the halls of my high school and I'd seen so many pictures on the wall of different shows they had done throughout the years, but nobody was doing shows anymore. And I was like really bummed about that. So in grade 10, me and my girlfriends, we got, um, we roped all our moms in. <laughs> we were like, if we start doing high school shows, like, will you guys help? Will you make costumes? Will you whatever? And they all jumped Everybody in. Involved. Yeah. I love that, right? Like that's a small community, like that's everybody it. coming in together. And like, that's what it requires, right? Like it, a show is like a mini village coming together, like making all the pieces happen. So this community, I think the word that like, you keep repeating it, and I think what you're creating in Groundswell is the, that sub-community within the community, and, and that really stands out. So would you say this is something that you're really passionate about? Is oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, you, you're that connection, totally. right? Totally. Yeah. I just think, like, community is everything. We're not meant to do, we're not meant to live life alone, hmm. I don't think. Um, and I don't mean, like, you have to necessarily have a romantic partner to live a life, but just have people around you that get you that you don't have to explain yourself. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You just walk in the room and they're happy to see you. That's it. <laughs> That's always such a good feeling. Isn't yeah. It? Just, yeah, like you just have those, those people that, you know, believe in you too, right? Yeah. And, and just cheerleaders. Yeah. So I see Jess, you're always involved in this community, like you're volunteering places. You you really want this place to grow and thrive. And so, so why Norfolk? And what do you love so much about this place? Oh man, I think, <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question. It's a combination of things. I think um, the the geography that we live in, you know, the nature we have around us, that is a huge benefit of being in Norfolk. But it's also the people here. Um, and that's why I'm so obsessed with community because we have so many beautiful people who live here with ideas, with talents, um, with love and vision. And I think that's what excites me. It's like, just because we're a small town doesn't mean we have small ideas. 
or small impact. I want to bring some of the music piece because I know we've been talking a lot about the, the theater and acting, but I know mm -hmm. that music is so important to you. Yes. And a big part yes. of your life. Yes. So tell me a bit more about your maybe influences and, and uh, what, what makes you feel alive in music. Just like theater, you know, I, I love performing music too. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there's something really cool about being on stage. Like that, I was, uh, before I came here today, I was like thinking about how alive I feel when I'm on stage. Mm -hmm. And I think that everyone kind of looks for that thing that makes them feel alive. Yeah. So for me, it's that. Awesome. So I thank you so much, Jess, for taking the time to meet with me. Uh, there's going to be more feature of passionate, uplifting community people through this uh, little video series. So keep watching. Thanks, Jess. Thank, thank you. So oh my gosh. <laughs> this is so much fun. Awesome. <laughs>
So other than that, when you're in Norfolk, like, what else do you love to do? What, what's your favorite spot or place that you like to visit or something you love to do? Love to go on the trails. I love going fishing on the ponds. Um, I just, you know, I just, Waterford, I just, I love, we have so many little places to go and see and do and, and What's stuff. happening in this community? You know what, there is, and I mean, the thing is, is we don't really, I mean, I laugh because there's so many of us who don't see what's here. They're right here. I mean, <laughs> Whistling Gardens, Bonnie Heath, we have all the wineries and stuff. The museum. Like, there's so many places to go. You can have a staycation mm -hmm. without leaving Norfolk. Yes. So thank you so much, Gary, for joining me today and being part of this uh, blog and video series. I invite you to check it on. Every month there will be somebody new, a new story, a new connection. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome to Passionate Folks, a blog and video series about the people of Norfolk. People that are involved in our community, people that bring a lot of energy. So this is about a conversation, this is about their story. So welcome to episode 3. Welcome to Passionate Folks. I'm Emily. I love to dig in people's lives, ask questions, and learn about people's passion. Today I'm here with Adam. Hi, Adam. Hi, how are you doing, Emily? Great. I'm happy that you're here, taking the time to sit down with me today. Uh, so I've known you for a little bit, uh, you know, small community, but people that don't know you. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. So my name is Adam Van Passen. I grew up here in Norfolk County. I was born onto a farm and I got to work on that farm growing up, which was a great learning experience from a young age. I got to understand what hard work was and what it was to be close to nature. So that was very cool for me uh, growing up like that. I, my dad also was a counselor for Haldeman Norfolk and he had a big part in shaping what is today Norfolk County. So I got to see that and watching him and experiencing him work through that really sparked an interest in me for the county and what it could become. Great. So not like the typical kids, we hear most high schoolers like just ready to get out of their hometowns and go explore the city and something else and it doesn't sound like that's your story. Not at all. I heard a lot of kids saying that they wanted to move on to bigger, better things and I just really didn't have that feeling. I always thought the biggest, best things were here in Norfolk to start. So you, I asked you to pick a location today and you bring me to a, a place that I don't know very well in Norfolk. Yeah. So tell me what, about where we are and why you picked it. This is a very cool spot. Uh, I know a lot of people drive by it, maybe on their way to Long Point or into Port Rowan, but this is Booth Harbor. So I grew up on Booth Harbor. My best friend, his family owned this place. So I grew up here hanging out, relaxing, boating, going out fishing, going out hunting. I worked here for a while. I did some volunteer work for the Shriners Club here, doing some chicken barbecues. So I really got to experience Norfolk and how community comes together. There's a lot of people that take up their summer residence here mm -hmm. in uh, trailers. And it's very cool to see all these people that are coming from other places in Ontario to enjoy what Norfolk has to offer. So it's just very cool to see that and experience it. One very cool fact about this place is that Booth Harbor has the largest amount of indoor boat storage on boat houses for all of the world. The world? Yes. Wow, that is crazy. This little place. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Very cool. Something to be proud of. I would absolutely say so. So we've been talking about nature and we spend lots of time outside. You bring me to a boating place where you like to fish and, and spend time. So. Okay, welcome back. Um, I'm looking for a mover and a seconder to reconvene an open session at 1.28 p.m. Moved by Councillor Van Andrieshi, seconded by Councillor Van Passen. All in favor? And with that, uh, we have nothing to report other than direction was provided to staff in closed session. Confirming bylaw. We have a mover to approve bylaw 2023-37. Moved by? 
adopt. So we have passed and seconded by Councillor Huffman. All in favor? Carried. And a motion to adjourn at 1.28 p.m. Moved by Councillor Huffman, seconded by Councillor Brunton. All in favor? Excellent. And we will break until 2 p.m. when we start Board of Health. Thank you. Tell me about your passion. Obviously, there's a connection somewhere there. Yes, absolutely. I, uh, especially recently with uh, everything that I've been seeing happen in the world, I'm very passionate about the earth. So I want the earth to be a good place. I want Norfolk County to be a good place. Everything that I love about Norfolk has to do with outside, has to do with nature, has to do with clean water, clean air, fresh trees, everything. So I just really think it's important to take care of everything that we have here in Norfolk County. And it's not an easy thing to do. So. No. We all have to start and do our part, that's the thing, right? Absolutely, and I'm doing my best, but it does get very difficult. It's easy to make the change, it's just hard to start. Um, so we were talking earlier about, you know, doing things around Norfolk and, and visiting places. I know you're a busy guy, like you work, you're a volunteer firefighter. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you do to de-stress and, and, and relax? I would say my number one most favorite thing to do to de-stress would be to just get out on Lake Erie. Whether that's ice fishing, fishing, boating, swimming, relaxing, it's just such an amazing place. As soon as you get on out on Lake Erie and you get away from shore a little bit, you just come out to this different zone. Other than this place, like what, uh, where else do you like to visit in Norfolk County? Where else? Uh, what's one of your other so favorite So I would say that my favorite spots in Norfolk County would have to be broken into two categories. One is nature, being Lake Erie, boating, all of that mm -hmm. kind of fun outdoor stuff. And I also like Norfolk's bounty. Before, maybe you had to go out to a place far away to enjoy all of this beer, wine, food, amazing service, but now we can just go out the back door, and before I can drive for 10 minutes, I found something that I can go to yeah, locally that's a amazing. Yeah, a couple of winery and, on the way here. And yeah, it has <laughs> passionate folks in it doing things, <laughs> like it's just great. All, all around here, there's so many amazing things you can do, and it's just growing, so I love seeing that. I thank you so much for your time. I, I love your connection with nature and what you want to do as far as your passion with the environment. I, I'm in line. We, we need to come together for this to happen, so hopefully we can inspire a few people with this little conversation here so Absolutely. thanks Adam cool thank you very much we'll for see you soon time. yeah <laughs>
if, if you're going to put a, a location on it, and if you're asking someone where you're from, uh, this area, you always say Norfolk County. No. Unless you're from Port Dover. <laughs> Did you say Port Dover? <laughs> then you say Port Dover for some reason. <laughs> I invited you to pick a place, uh, so tell us where we are and why you decided to invite me here. So we're at where I work, uh, Blue Bear Hill Estates, uh, which my family owns as well too. Uh, this is where I spend probably my entire day, every day of the year. So we're located on the patio here and we're basically overlooking the patch. And uh, you probably cannot see from the camera because it's on the other side of the camera, but the lake is just on the other side. Um, I love to hear about people's passion and I know you have a lot of projects going on and I want to dig further into your passion. So what do you think really stands out for you? What are, what are you really passionate about? Uh, so day in day out I'm typically uh, making wine um, or working the field so that's something I'm really passionate about. I'm also the president of the Ontario South Coast Wineries and Growers Association which encompasses Norfolk along with other uh, neighboring counties and so I'm really passionate about trying to raise awareness of this area for growing grapes and making uh, world-class wines. And so winemaking, like what draws you to it? Why are you making your whole life right now? And, and why winemaking in Norfolk County? Well, I guess you could say it's one of the best uh, agricultural products you can make. <laughs> uh, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's something that you can preserve and like even after the crop is finished, you still have to work with the crop that you were working out in the field all year round and, and when you put it in a glass of wine or you, ate, you have memories of how that year was when, when that that wine was made. Uh, so it sounds like you spent a lot of time on this farm, a lot of time on this like part of Norfolk <laughs> County but if you have to time to de-stress where would you go? What do you do in Norfolk? I definitely like going to the beach um, so you know getting out in the water when it's a hot day is uh, uh, it's truly nice. Uh, Not too far from Turkey Point, I guess. Yeah, you can yeah. roll down the hill. Yeah, or... we, we got uh, excellent restaurants here too, so uh, which is pretty amazing for the per capita, the amount of people that live in Norfolk County that we have enough restaurants. We count them uh, more than your two hands or whatever, which is Really nice. good ones too, right? Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> it is so exciting to see how our agro tourism industry is developing in our area, and, and it's kind of cool to see you guys like working together and really promoting this area. Well, when you think about farming, uh, from what it was in the past, uh, it has to evolve over time though to make it um, an industry that can support itself. It allows people to be able to figure out ways to uh, succeed or have succession in their family um, to go to that next generation so that way we can have countless more generations of those families living in Norfolk County growing the things that their grandparents grew. And keeping the passion alive. Exactly, yeah. I thank you so much for your time, Nick. I, no I thank you for inviting me in this beautiful place. I cannot wait to explore some more. And... It's too bad it's not pizza day. <laughs> I know, I heard that was really yeah. good. <laughs> I'll come back, I'll be back. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. No worries. Cheers. Welcome to episode 6 of Passionate Folks. This is a blog and video series about the people of Norfolk. We sit down, have a conversation, hear about their passion and what lights them up. I'm excited to introduce the next guest. Welcome to Passionate Folks. My name is Emily. I love to connect with people, having some conversation and learning about people's passion. Today I'm sitting here with Sue. Hey Sue. Yeah, you bet. I'm so glad that you took the time to come out and have a conversation with me. Well, thanks for asking me. Yeah, so for people that don't know you, can you start with introducing yourself, where you live, where you're from, and a little bit more about you? Okay, sure. Uh, my name is Sue Downs. I uh, live in Simcoe, uh, born and raised here. And I work for the Simple Reformer newspaper and started there way back in 1988. So, and uh, love my job, love Norfolk County, and was really pleased that uh, Emily asked me to be part of this. 
I think. <laughs> so far, so good. So far, so good. Yeah, so far, so good. Great. So as always, Sue, I, I ask a guest to pick a location so we can explore it and discover a hidden gem in Norfolk County. And this one is, is a little bit different. So tell me where we are and, and why you brought me here. So we're at uh, Norfolk County Fair. We're at the bottom of the uh, Junior Farmers Building and here. So why, why do you pick the fair? What, what's so special about the fair to you? Um, I think for myself, Norfolk County Fair is like one of the largest events that happen in Norfolk County um, every year. Uh, it's always been near and dear to my heart. Like I think uh, so many childhood memories. It's all about tradition. Um, for us growing up, at my age, I've only missed one fair in all of my years and that was when I was in, in Timmins. So um, I just love the fact that you can come to the fair. There's so much excitement. There's always lots of things to see and do. Like family would come home during Thanksgiving weekend. And I think that still happens today, right? Like it's all about tradition and all about community, which I feel like I'm pretty passionate about. Yeah, so I was just going to ask you a little bit more about your passion. I see you a lot being involved in the community and supporting local businesses. And it seems like it's, it's really important to you and close to your heart. I like to promote local as much as possible. So whenever we go for dinner a lot of people will go do you ever stay home because <laughs> you'll constantly see posts on social media on Facebook or on Twitter and it's like you know we're at the barrel we're doing this we're at Long Point Eagle Adventure we're you know it's so good that you're taking the time to promote those local businesses and, and support and I remember when I started my business you were one of the, the big supporter of sharing what I was doing and I know a lot of people have felt the love that you give huh? to entrepreneurs so I want to thank you for that Oh, well, you're welcome, but it does make you feel good, and it is it is important. I feel that you know if we can, you know, support each other as much as possible. Like it's 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 again, it's all about giving back. So Norfolk County and specifically Simcoe has changed quite a lot. We are moving in a different direction in our county. So from you like growing up in Simcoe and in the downtown, and what's happening around now, like. Um, What's the highlights for you? Okay, well, the highlight growing up was always, um, you know, going downtown on the weekend. People that are watching this that are my age would remember you <laughs> used to be able to go to the Tartan restaurant and Woolworths and different places down there. Um, but I think a lot of the exciting thing that I see now is a lot of the collaborations that are mm -hmm. happening within Norfolk County. And uh, one that stands out is, um, you know, Burning Kiln and then Long Point Eco. And then along came, uh, you know, my buddy Dusty and the guys from Hometown <laughs> Brew. And then now Joy Cafe out there. So it's really cool to see a lot of the business people working with each other yes. and stuff like that too. So that sort of stuff. You don't have to go too far. You show up there and everything I know, that you love is right I there. <laughs> it's like a lot of renewed, you know, it just give, it just seems like a lot of positive things are happening within our community. And it's really good to see. So I know you have a pretty high stress job. So maybe tell me a little bit more about what you do to relax, calm down and look after yourself. Okay, well, I do like to um, garden. I find that, you know, if you're kind of stressful and it's a stressful day, you get out there and take it out on all the weeds in your garden. <laughs> um, I also like to, uh, you know, walk along the trail um, from Davis Street and then head out along the 14th or whatever. And you can, like, it's heading right towards Waterford, so you can actually walk from there right into Waterford. Um, I've got a dog that keeps me pretty busy and then a group of like really good friends that we are going out with each other like all the time and stuff like that. I know you have a lot of favorite spots in Norfolk so we already named a few but if you have a day off and you want to explore Norfolk County is there one specific place that you actually love to visit that you feel just at home? I would say for myself it depends on the day so if it's just something that I want to go and like you know, do a walk or whatever, it would be my trail on the 14th because it is it is kind of private, there's not, you run, do run into a lot of the same people and stuff yes. like that. I also like going down to um, Dover and I'll sit at the cafe and yeah. kind of look around there. <laughs> you can watch a little bit? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, um, that sort of stuff and then even take off and go to the pier. Actually, um, my mom has, uh, has a bench there for my grandfather. Who was a fisherman down yeah, in Port Dover as well too, so it's kind of nice. Benches. Yeah. Cool. It sounds like so, pretty much everything you need is right here. Why? Why should I go out of town? Uh, why do I need to go out of town? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here right that you know, right in Norfolk that we need. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Uh, I love to hear your passion for Norfolk and how well you support the local businesses and, and just I see you at fundraiser and you're always involved in your group of friends and supporting whatever is happening in the county. So 
uh, uh, we need more of you, Sue and, and Norfolk. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining me today. And I think this little chat, I'd love to get to know you better and hear more about your passions. Well, thanks very much for allowing me the opportunity. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>
one month tours with a student and I had a buddy of mine, Jimmy Boskill, who was a student of mine. He said, when you retire, we're going on tour. My son is in a band, the May Hemingways, so he traveled lots east, so he booked us from Peterborough to Newfoundland, 24 gigs Did in 26 you nights. Where? Both, you know, but you make, you know, as a musician, you make way more at a house concert and play more concert less with people listening. Yeah. People love to play, right? So oftentimes people think you need the applause as much as you need the money. And many <laughs> many people are lined up. So it's like, you don't want to do it? That's okay. I've got Tiny Talent Time and his brother here that will play for you, you know? And so people, oh, that's why it's so nice to be in a place like this where you know that their entertainment budget yeah. is a really significant amount. And there are a lot of places in town here. The 211 does it as well. Even the, the Norfolk has a whack of uh, music. And it's, and it's getting bigger around here with all the, you know, with the, with the craft beer industry, mm -hmm. the wine industry, all those places are looking for some entertainment to, to get their clients in. So I think it's, you know, it, um, it's going to be significant. It, it's just a tricky game. So music, obviously a big part of your life? It is a big part of my life, yeah. I, uh, I think my, I started when I was 13. My brother handed me a John Prine album, the very first one with him sitting on the hay bale and a guitar and showed me the C, F, and G chord. And I never had a lesson after that. You just learn on your own? I just learn on my own. Guitar has, and, and stringed instruments often have tablature. Yep. Especially ones that have frets, so they're, it's a grid really. So they can like uh, uh, it's easy on notation to put a number one on a one. You know yep. you're in for okay, you know so it's an easier so, system. Yep. But I, what happened was I had been in, I was working in the teachers union. I had been seconded out of teaching for a couple of years. But the head of music was leaving to become a minister, and he said, uh, "Dan, um, can you teach kids how to play guitar?" And I said, "Absolutely." And I said, "Now, Larry, you know I don't read music, right?" And, you don't? And I said, no, but I'll buy tablature. So at any rate, years made funny. Made it work. Made it work. And down the road it was funny because Jimmy Boskill, who yes. is a wizard player, doesn't read music either. He had auditioned for this art school and I was sitting at me. They weren't going to let him in because he didn't read music. And I said, I should let you folks know, as you know, I don't read music. And I said, if you're not letting this kid into the program, give me two weeks notice because I'm not going to be the guitar teacher that wouldn't take him in. <laughs> so you got to keep it moving. Is that what you one of your favorite instruments? Like? Yeah, this is, yeah, this is, it's a Latin instrument. It comes from like uh, the Andes, okay. so Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Chile. It's usually used in like... But then I found, being sort of a folky doki player too, it's... It's like a good bluegrass instrument too, and it's like in the day and age of cutbacks when the bluegrass bands start firing the banjo player and the mandolin player, you get both with one. Show up with this one here. You got it. Yeah. Good drumming game. That's right. Perfect. <laughs> and this is a charango, and it is uh, higher up. So I started with one of these. But, and then I'm a big fella, so it's, yeah. you know, and you don't smaller. need that strap that sticks right in your belly button. Like, you couldn't peel that off with a grow <laughs> All right, so you do some improv. You... I do. So, like, uh, what's a, give me a title to a song never before written. It can be anything. Uh, let's go with the Bikini Crepe, I guess. Bikini Crepe? <laughs> We're here, the Crepe House. So. Well, it's more appropriate on a day like today. To not sing about martini So let's think while we're in the land of sand About a crepe martini No pina colada beside you now No, it's done somehow Here comes the custom now We're probably gonna order the crepe bikini Now the thing about the bikini crepe It's teeny weeny how they make I'm not sure if it's a speedo sauce, but it's nice all the same. Oh, it's teeny weeny, but it's my favorite battle. Crepe bikini. Yes, sirree. I think he's making me one now. And it might be true that you can't wait for your bikini crepe, but that's okay. 
got time on my hand. Right on. All right, cheers, Sam. Cheers. Thanks for joining me. Have a coffee. That Absolutely. Awesome. Right on. Love it. Good. Thank you very much. Great. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Thanks, Drew. Great, guys. <laughs> no, it's not possible. No, I cannot tell you what to say. Um, but uh, um, What if there was a place just outside the hustle and bustle where the beauty of nature was right at your doorstep inviting you to join in the fun. Good job, guys. Got it. <laughs> what if there was a place where the landscapes were as diverse as the bounty they produced. And the term, field fresh, was more than just a marketing ploy. It was a way of life. What if there was a place where history and heritage shared the stage with technology and innovation? And success happened without much fanfare on back roads nurtured by wise and hardworking people. What if there was a place as lush as an ancient garden that was, for centuries, a place to explore, live, and play? A place of promises and hope. A landscape filled with possibility. And what if this wasn't just a place to escape to? but a place you could settle into. What would you call such a place? Well, we call it Norfolk County. Welcome to Passionate Folks, a blog and video series about people who live in Norfolk. People that get involved in our community, people that are passionate about living here. We sit down, have a conversation and learn about their stories. Welcome to Passionate Folks. I am Emily. I love to connect with people. I love to ask questions and get to know people better. So today I'm sitting here with Scott. Hey. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Uh, so Scott, to start, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself, who you are, where you're from, and where you live? Um, my name is Scott McCray. I am a chef here in Norfolk County. I'm the chef at David's Restaurant in town, and I live in Port Dover, or just outside. And yeah, all my family is from Port Dover. I moved here in high school and left for a bit and moved back, and now made it, I, your home. Made it my home. Yeah, it was my home before. I realized it was my home while I was away, and 
Yeah. He came back to the roots. Yes, exactly. Uh, so as I do with every guest, I ask you to pick a place in Norfolk County for us to do this interview. Mm -hmm. So tell me where you invited me and why you picked this place. Um, well, we're here at Matt's Fruit Barn, just outside of town. And Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome all members and guests to the May 2nd, 2023 Board of Health meeting and remind everyone that our meetings are web streamed and televised. Please ensure your phones are on silent mode. For those attending virtually, please mute yourself when not speaking. For staff in attendance, please use virtually, please use the Microsoft Teams hand raise feature icon to be called upon and remove it after you finish speaking. When you're called upon to speak, please turn on your camera and unmute yourself. With that, I call the May 2nd, 2023 Board of Health meeting to order. We have received regrets from Councillor Michelli and Councillor Duffy at this time. It appears that all other members of council are in attendance. And with that, I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Moved by Councillor Huffman, seconded by Councillor Barry. All in favor? Barry, thank you. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Being none, there are no consent items today. We have no early close today, and we have no deputations or presentations today. We're going to approve our meetings minutes from uh, Board of Health of March 7th, 8.1, 8.2, the special Board of Health meeting March 28th, both open and closed. So unless there are any errors or omissions, I'm looking for a motion to move as presented. Council, sorry, board member Columbus, seconded by board member Van Adrishi. All in favor? Carried. We have the following communication items before us today 9.1 Acting Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Joyce Locke, update, and 9.2 Alpha's 2023 AGM and conference. With that, I believe we need to turn it over to Syed, our Director of Public Health, to introduce our communications items. All right, can I get you to turn your mic on, thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, I'm going to invite Dr. Locke for our report. Thank you, Syed, and through you, Madam Chair, uh, I will not belabor the board, my report too much. It's relatively self-explanatory. Um, my, um, it just it was, it's a bit of a report on my first uh, few weeks here at the health unit uh, and the orientation that I've been undergoing. Uh, I just want to give a word of appreciation to all the staff at the health unit uh, who have welcomed me very warmly and uh, been very patient with me as I learned some of the uh, you know, minor details of how things work locally. Um, it's been a very uh, good four weeks for me. The uh, the other thing is I'm trying to understand the community a bit better. So I've been looking at uh, the health status of our daily today, the community needs assessment, which gives a picture of the health status of the community. Um, and I've been uh, reviewing uh, the annual service plan so that I understand a little bit what the key priorities are for the health unit in the upcoming year. 
uh, as well as uh, meeting with the managers and the programs uh, to talk with them one on one on um, what they see as their um, issues that are on their table right now. Uh, further to that, I've also uh, the uh, the uh, health unit is uh, intimately connected uh, through various meetings that I attend. Uh, with other health units across the province. Um, and so I have listed some of those for you. Uh, so there is the Council of Medical Officer of Health, which consists of uh, all the medical officers of health and their associates across the, across the province. Um, we tend to meet uh, by video conferencing uh, once a month for an hour to uh, allow all of us to share um, items of concerns or challenges and we we uh, age each other to support one another with advice and counsel. There's also a quarterly meeting, which is uh, a more formal meeting where uh, we where we often have uh, visits from um, the chief medical officer of health from uh, Public Health Ontario, and uh, we also um, engage other uh, organizations from time to time as needed. Uh, it's also a time for uh, the various working groups from the Council of Medical Officer of Health to uh, provide uh, presentations on um, how their work is going. Uh, this is a collaborative effort. Um, so for instance, on challenging areas such as uh, the current uh, rise in substance use, uh, mental health issues, um, there is uh, there may be working groups on that. And they often work hand in hand with the ministry um, uh, sectors uh, who, who also have some hand to play on that. Um, and uh, so they, uh, those reports help us all to see um, what direction public health is taking across the province and how we can incorporate that into our local programs. Um, also more, more close to home, the, um, there is the Central West Medical Officers Health uh, Group. This consists of the um, medical officers health from uh, regions closer to home. So that includes um, Halton, Hamilton, Niagara, ourselves, and Grant, and Waterloo, and Well. Uh, and so we, we, we meet together uh, often just to be sure that we are working hand in hand. It's uh, our, our borders are somewhat fluid. They're there for us as, as administrators, but they're not there for our communities, members who live there. And so we often try and ensure that we are aligned in, in our approaches. Uh, and we also share, again, common challenges and how we're going to address those. Um, and uh, I think that's about it. I did want to draw attention to the upcoming Association of Local Public Health Agencies um, uh, meeting in Toronto in June, I think it is. Uh, there is a Board of Health section there, a meeting there, and it's usually a very uh, rewarding uh, session for Board of Health members, and I do encourage you all to attempt to attend. Thanks, Lilo, Madam Chair, that's my report. Thank you very much, Dr. Locke. Are there questions from board members? Board member Huffman. Sorry, I sound prepared with my microphone. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, what is there? Um, would you be able to send us some information regarding that meeting that you were just talking about? Yes. Or did did we get something already, Syed? I know sometimes we get so much stuff and it's hard to weed through, so it just sounds interesting. It, it, okay, through you, Madam Chair, you're just responding. Yeah, so it has gone out. If not, Syed will ensure that it goes out again. Um, it uh, it it's. I, there are um, Board of Health representatives from across the province from multiple health units. So I, I do think uh, you'll find it enriching to uh, talk to some of your colleagues and uh, hear what their challenges are at their health units. The, there is a, a list of speakers, uh, which is also um, quite uh, interesting. And then there is uh, on the second day, there is uh, a Board of Health meeting uh, where the various Board of Health and agenda items are tabled for interest and discussion. Board member Columbus, then Van Passen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Locke, um, over the past couple of years, a certain percentage of the population across Canada 
was opposed to getting a COVID vaccination immunization, I guess we'll call it. Has that trickled down to uh, the school system whereby some families don't want their children immunized with other for other vaccinations with lumps and diphtheria and whatever polio? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, um, the uh, overall um, vaccine uptake rates across the province, and I've actually, uh, the, the childhood ones here, I've, I've reviewed them with our team, are really quite good for those uh, pediatric ones like uh, diphtheria, pertussis, polio, uh, they were running about 90%. Uh, uh, they are behind right now, so the, those uh, those children who would have uh, required them during the COVID uh, years, um, often their family doctor's offices were closed, so the schools were also not in, in person. Um, so there's been um, a major drive this year to catch up with the cohort that was born in 2005 and 2018. And then next year, they'll uh, do the 2006 and 2016. So it'll be a few years to catch up. Um, so overall, uh, the vaccine uptake is good in this region. It does fall off. There is a, a, a little, not as good rates in the with grade seven, grade eight groups, but they're still pretty good. Um, and um, there's always a, a sector who, for their, um, their personal uh, health beliefs, uh, don't want to be vaccinated. Um, uh, and I often say that health beliefs are, are complex and they have complex origins. Um, and uh, the best thing that uh, our citizens can do for themselves is be vaccinated. And so that if you happen to have in your community people who are unvaccinated, as long as you and your children have the vaccine, you and your children have that armor against those infectious diseases. Thank you. Board Member Van Passen. Yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, just to follow up on uh, Member Huffman's question, I get the benefit that this is a Health and Social Services Advisory Committee, just like it was last week. That next item of correspondence, I think, lists all the details of my conference. Board Member Van Andrieshi. Thank you, Madam Chair. And through you, I, I was interested in when we were talking about um, having our shots. Um, have the has the provincial government extended it so if you were going after your shingle shot and you were up to 70 years old it's paid for by the province uh has that been extended now to 70 or has it they haven't changed it back then? because i'm hearing that you can still get a shingle shot after 70 where you're not paying again does that exist here do you know? I'd actually have to defer to our vaccine preventable diseases because I'm actually not up on what's actually happened with the age, um, the age limit on that. So I think best to do is ask the right number your picnic to bring. Yeah, through. the only reason I ask is because my husband went. We went yesterday and he's 74, and he was there was for payment to be made. But I thought, well, wait a minute, I was told up to 70, and then yeah, but I didn't know what what we were doing here. Yeah, well, the, the general philosophy of the Ministry of Health and of Public Health in general is that um, this is a catch up time oh, for, over we're... those COVID years. Um, so there's been leniency applied in many directions. For instance, uh, the human papillomavirus vaccine is only eligible in, in certain high school grades, but right. we've extended that as well. That would for catch up. So, um, I'm not 100% sure about the shingles vaccine to probably next year. Oh, that's good. Good news. Thank you. Uh, Board Member Barry. Well, we're about to walk in through the chair. I have a question about the vaccination rates you mentioned are pretty good. Is it um, pretty universal across both counties? Or is it, like, is I only pretty got, consistent? Yeah, I'd have to ask again you know, the team to break that down for me. I only got sort of high level the data. I haven't had a chance to break it down between the two different counties. Is that data available? I think I think it should be available. If they are able in general to break a vaccine rates down by postal codes. Now postal codes don't always strictly follow 
county line, so sometimes there's a little bit of lack of clarity, but uh, they should be able to. They should also be able to break down the schools. Yeah, so the schools within the region. Okay, is that something um, that you'd be interested enough or concerned enough that you would look at? I think it's a, a valid question. I, I have I have begun to realize that the local can hold in a large estate. Um, and uh, and uh, that that is something I think that you didn't mention to Saya that we had to be very sensitive to. So um, yeah, we hey, thank you. I have a question for you, Dr. Locke. Um, first of all, thank you for a written report. Uh, that's very helpful for the public as well. And I know you've, you've been busy, so it's great to see what you've been up to. My first, or I guess my only question is, is actually around the, the bottom footnote in your report with the Associate Medical Officer of Health. Um, can you share what differs between the Associate position, the Medical Officer of Health position, and I see that, that Niagara is posting for an additional um, person in that role. So what is the requirement to bring on the Associate Medical Officer of Health? Um, what What is the difference in the job description? And is it harder to find or easier, sorry, to find associate officers as opposed to finding or filling out a medical officer of health uh, full time position. For you, Chair. Sure. Um, uh, so, uh, for smaller health units uh, of this size, um, even a little bit larger, uh, the, the job is such that it can be uh, met by one full-time equivalent for one person. Um, as the community grows in size, uh, the workload uh, expands, and in those situations, um, very often the ministry will allow for uh, an associate medical officer help. That associate um, then reports to the medical officer. Um, and in terms of, and the job that the medical officer of health does and the associate does is often decided at the local level. Um, and, and how the work is distributed depends on the local workload and where it's how they can divvy up between the two of them equally. Um, I think you do require ministry approval to engage an associate um, because there's monetary elements attached to it. Um, the in general, it's easier to find an associate because many of the new graduates uh, from the Public Health and Preventive Medicine Residency Training Program uh, start their careers as associates. Um, and then after some years of running the ropes a bit more, they then move on to a um, medical officer of health position. That said, uh, there have been new graduates uh, many of several of them who've had previous uh, masters of business administration degrees who um, have jumped right into the uh, medical office and health position um, and uh, then they are they are supported through the associate medical officer of health at the provincial level chief the associate chief medical officer of health as well as their local colleagues of state or any office. Wow, that's very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. And so is there a population size that's a threshold? That's a big question. It's um, so there's a. Uh, when when the issue of public health reform comes up, it always always begs the question of, well, how many medical officers and associates are sufficient um, and um, what kind of community size is required for you to require more than one? Um, there have been some numbers tossed around, but it's not based on any science. So uh, I think that usually once the population gets to be somewhere above 250,000, um, then we need for a second uh, metabolism of an license. And last question, do you know if, if provincially the rate of pay is also <clears throat> set and mandated for that role? Yes. Okay. In fact, um, there is currently um, an issue on the table uh, where the ministry 
try to set um, a, a little different standard on the associate medical officers health pay and how much was contributed locally and how much was contributed provincially. Um, and it, it that did bring to light that how much is contributed locally varies a lot across the province. So that's currently under discussion, but the net pay is the same. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Are there any last questions yes. to Dr. Wolf? Just to add to that, I'm just actually thinking in Toronto, uh, because it's so large, they have um, they have an added layer. I think uh, they've got the chief, they've got the medical officers out, they've got several associates, and then they have public health physicians. And so in, in that category, that, that they have a different thing. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, welcome aboard again. I'm glad to see that staff have been very helpful and you've been very busy. And again, thank you for joining and putting information in writing for the public's benefit. Um, Syed, I think we're going to jump back over to you and, unless you have any comments on the AGM communications. Thank you through you, Madam Chair. So there is an annual general meeting and conference from Alpha, which is Association of Local Public Health Agencies in Ontario from June 12th to 14th in Toronto. So it's the invitation is part of your agenda pay package on page 14. So if any board members are interested, please let us know and we'll coordinate the registration and the voting process. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Any questions? Board no problem. Thank you, Madam Chair. Have we ever had anybody attend this before? Stop, no, if anyone's ever from the Board of Health. Go ahead, sorry. I was chairing the meeting. Go ahead, Van Dyke. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to Board Member Huffman. Yes, in the past, we have had uh, both members of the Advisory Committee uh, and or the Board of Health attend. And um, I believe that the um, the health unit does include some funding in the training budget for uh, Board of Health members to uh, attend something like this. So it's usually uh, in the past, it's been um, two, maybe three members for that attend. Any other questions? Okay, then I believe we're looking for a motion. I'm just sorry, did I, uh, Madam Clerk, did I, did we move a motion to, sorry, the minutes? Just wondering if I, okay, okay, good. Check mark. Um, okay, so then we are looking for uh, a motion to receive the communication items moved by Board Member Van Andrishi, seconded by Board Member Columbus. All in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. Staff reports is uh, we're on to item 10.1 Environmental Health Emerging Trends 2023 HSS 23015. And with that, I'll go back over to our Director of Public Health to introduce the report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, I introduce uh, Alexis Atkinson, Program Manager for Environmental Health Team, to present this report. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Through the chair to the members of the Board of Health, I will be presenting HSS 23-015, Environmental Health Emerging Trends 2023. The COVID-19 pandemic impacted in unprecedented terms the way people survived and functioned. Remote work became mainstream and job losses led people to think outside the box to adapt to our new world. As the world and Haldeman Norfolk counties open back up for business, new initiatives to assist our counties and reinvigorate a sense of community have become a priority to help recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result of adaptations and initiatives, some new and emerging trends in environmental health include home-based and personal service businesses, mobile food businesses, and an increased demand for special events and tourism promotion. Other notable changes to the environmental health program include regulatory changes to dr drinking water systems and regulatory changes to bunkhouse inspections. In November 2021, the Ministry of Health released a guide to starting a home-based food business to support the move towards more home-based food businesses in Ontario. These amendments effectively removed several of the barriers that made it difficult for an individual to operate a food business from their home. 
Home-based food businesses and personal service businesses are growing in popularity. Currently, there are 25 home-based food businesses and a handful of personal service businesses. The rise in popularity of mobile food businesses is also a growing trend. The health unit currently has 49 active operators to inspect. Regulatory changes uh, to definitions of food premises have also affected the oversight and enforcement of the small drinking water system regulation. All fixed food businesses, including home-based home food businesses, are now considered small drinking water systems. Mobile food businesses also require more attention to ensure that operators are knowledgeable of measures to keep their water safe, which they often receive from holding tanks. Haldeman and Norfolk counties have a long history in agriculture, with Norfolk County being dubbed as Ontario's garden. Every year, the communities of Haldeman and Norfolk welcome over 4,500 international agricultural workers, more than almost every other region in the province, increasing our population 5 to 10% every growing season. As a result, the Haldeman Norfolk Health Unit has one of the largest numbers of seasonal housing units to accommodate international agricultural workers within Ontario. Service Canada requires housing inspections to be included within the Labour Market Impact Assessment, LMIA, that farmers must submit to request workers for all agricultural stream programs where the employer is providing housing for these workers. The Environmental Health Team has inspected 55 new seasonal housing facilities since 2021. In 2019, there were a total of 626 inspections, and in 2022, a total of 742. Of note, the populations of Haldem and Norfolk have also grown since the last census in 2016, with Norfolk increasing its population by 5.4% and Haldeman County increasing its population by 7.9%. Lastly, tourism and special events are making a comeback in both counties. In 2022, the Environmental Health Team approved 153 separate events and 477 vendor applications. As of March 16th, 2023, we have received 53 event applications and 94 applications uh, for, for vendors, which is on track to significantly exceed the 2022 numbers. The environmental health team will focus public health services to address emerging trends in the environmental health program. The key is awareness, education of the public, the development of innovative ideas to address providing services and consultation with the Board of Health to address challenges while providing excellent service to our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. That's great. Are there any questions from Board of Health members? Not seeing any. I just I have one question for you. I think that you said we're seeing our a population increase with farm workers, five to ten percent annually, is that yes. is that what you said? And yes. we es estimate about five thousand workers. Yep, we're seeing an increase of a minimum two hundred and fifty each growing season. Uh, approximately, yes. And there's different streams now that are available, so there are one to two streams available as well as just the season as well. Um, so there is definitely an increase in the amount of ag international agriculturals that we are receiving in our counties. I'm shocked to hear those numbers. I'm surprised that we'd have an increase of 250, minimum 250 new workers coming into the community annually when we're developing so much agricultural land all the time. And I'm very surprised by that. That's interesting. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands, so thank you, Alexis, for that report. Uh, would someone yeah. wish to move the staff recommendation? Moved by Board Member Columbus, seconded by Board Member Huffman. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thank you. 10.2, can you, uh, Community Needs Assessment 2022 HSS 23020. Uh, with that, back over to Syed, our Director of Public Health, to introduce staff and the report. Thank you to you, Madam Chair. I introduce Marcia and Amontodo, Program Manager for Professional Practice and Quality Assurance to present this report. Thank you. Good afternoon. Through you, Madam Chair, to the committee, I will present the Haldeman Norfolk Health and Social Services 2022 Community Needs Assessment Information Memo Report, HSS 
23-020 to be received as information. The community needs assessment was repeated in 2022 following the same method metho metho oh, methodology as the one completed in 2019. It was a community based participatory mixed methods approach using a survey focus group and key informant interviews and community profile. There were 1404 completed responses, which is an increase from 2019 survey. A few highlights are increased diversity among respondents compared to 2019. Some health protecting behaviors are less commonly practiced than in 2019. Respondents generally reported their health and their family's health had worsened during the pandemic and respondents had low levels of familiarity with programs at um, HNHSS. Attached is, an inform is the information memo, um, is an infographic and also the report. HNHSS is now working on a dissemination plan, which will start after this information memo um, is accepted by the Board of Health today. As a start, the infographic and report will be posted on the website with a media release. A letter will be sent to community partners to let them know where they can access the report. Presentations to HNHSS internal teams have started so that the teams can incorporate the information into their program planning. To assist with increasing the public's knowledge of our, ser of our services, the HN HSS website is being updated. Staff um, are attending community events and fairs and processes for referrals across programs are being developed uh, um, or revised. Thank you for receiving the information memo today. Thank you very much. Questions from the board. Seeing none, I have a couple questions for you on the collection of information. Um, so is this something where we're deploying staff out into the community and, and we're how do we go about collecting the data? Is it similar to our homelessness um, strategy where we go out and chat with people on the streets? Is that our approach to collecting information or? Um, so just a point of clarification, you're talking specifically for the survey? Yes. Um, so it was um, done in various ways to get the data. Um, so there was, there were staff who were out in the community at various pop-up um, pop-ups across the community. Um, there were also surveys that were put into community areas such as the library, um, libraries or community centers as well. And then clients could drop off the surveys um, in any of our offices. So that was sort of the paper copies. There was also um, a link through the website where clients could go in, the public could go in and put the um, survey directly into the website as well. Um, and that was, um, advertised through various methods with little cards and and so on through the community as well if people wanted to respond in um, in that way. Um, then there was also focus groups that were um, that were done as well too with specific um, groups throughout uh, some of our uh, community partners. Um, specific focus groups were um, were done as well. So that's how we got the um, 1404 responses that were collected. OK, and then off the top of your head, do you recall how many responses came in um, in 2019? It's up 6.5. I was going to say it. I think it's in. Um, I don't have the exact number, but I know it was up. I could probably find that out for you and let, get back to you with that. OK, and then when do we anticipate moving ahead with the next one? I, I ask because I think it's something that we should really be pushing um, the messaging on. I know staff do a, um, try to share the word, but I think that's something that the Board of Health can also help with and Health and Social Services, like 1,404 is a pretty uh, low survey response overall. So I'd like to see more data collected um, to, to really get actual numbers in the future. So do we have plans on when our next community needs assessment um, information would 
would go out to be captured? Um, Madam Chair, I will send that question on to uh, Mr. Shaw for response, please. Sure, thank you. Thank you uh, to you, Madam Chair. So we do community need assessment every four years. Every four years, okay. I didn't know if we took a break from 2019 because of COVID or, okay, four years. Um, yeah, I think at the at the appropriate time, if we could really preliminarily share that messaging with the Board of Health of the day um, and, and try to push it out as much as we can and, and grab more information. I have a couple more uh, comments to make, but I got a, a couple hands. So, Councillor, Board Member Van Passens and then Board Member Van Andrishi. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was going to say this was one of my concerns, but I guess I should call it an observation. Um, it's not in my mind, um, like a totally random survey. If you look at some of the footnotes and things, um, you know, like 25% of the people that fill out the survey work in the healthcare system. I think a lot of the focus groups had clients involved that have used the services. Um, there's probably a lot of unconscious bias in the results of this survey, but it is consistent with the last survey. So you can see uh, trends evolving because you're, you know, whether the data is skewed or not, it's con cons it's skewed consistently because, um, you know, you're, you're not going to call this just a random survey of the public to see what the, the mood is of the people. I think it, it does boil down to the focus of the needs because we've got a lot of input from the people who are the, either use the services or deliver the services and see it day to day. So I think there is a lot of value to it. But um, I can't really call it just a totally random survey of the feel of the people of the general public. Board member Van Andrewshi. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you. Um, since we, I, I think your question uh, at the uh, at the end of the meeting, but at the end of the day, we're gathering all this information and assessment of what's going on. What are we doing with it, and how are we moving forward with the information? You, Madam Chair, I can respond to that. So uh, currently we are in a process of developing our strategic uh, plan for the health unit. So all the findings and the information and the needs of the community will be translated and will be part of that uh, strategic plan for, for the health unit. So if I can continue with one more question there. So the information that we gathered prior to this survey, the last survey, um, what what changes did we make or what new opportunities do we have? How do we enhance the programs that we got through that survey so that we can move them when we've got this survey results now? Let's take that and build on it. Was, was there things that were continuous that you were looking forward to to enhance in, in the programs that are available through the service? Thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Madam Chair, unfortunately, unfortunately, we didn't do anything of our 2019 survey because like we were in a process of developing a plan then the pandemic hit so everything was paused i think go ahead thank you um thank you madam chair three to councilor van den Drishi. i think um organizationally uh definitely um uh, mr shaw is correct that the the health unit had to shift focus um, because of what was going on organizationally within health and social services as a division. Out of the last community needs assessment, we heard from people that they um, wanted to see less silos in service and more integrated service. And I think that there is um, much more uh, collaboration happening between um public health and social services and housing than perhaps historically and um, we see staff working together more closely in cross-functional teams um with you know professionals from public health from social assistance from housing from homelessness in order to better support people so at a program level yes there was shift for or uh, because of COVID at an organizational level, I, I think we did work on, uh, I think we did some really great work on that. What we talked about at the um, meeting was the fact that we were gonna move forward. We were talking about what services are offered, more uh, getting out to the public and more advertisements of what's going on and what we can must be known to, to the constituents. Thank you. Dr. Locke, did you want to add something? I'll turn you, Madam Chair, if I may. Uh, yeah, just to 
had my perspective. So um, the community needs assessment <coughs> is sort of like a community health status report. So, um, so it tells us a little bit how the community is doing. So um, things like education and economics and access to health, health uh, like income and access to health care, and those sort of things are key determinants of, of health um, and well-being. Um, and so uh, I, I sort of, it's sort of to me akin to in the acute care world, it's in there you do, you know, lab tests and x-rays and you kind of figure out how healthy your sick patient is. Um, and this is sort of the, this is how healthy or sick our community is. And um, so again, it is, it is the hope of um, and the efforts of public health to try and use the data um, intimately to to try and move it forward. Um, and because addressing those complex issues that affect our well-being are often multi-organizational um, and require um, inputs at the local level and the provincial level and at the federal level, uh, that's partly why we try and have those sort of those Council of Mental Officer Health working groups to see if how we can, um, how by using our collective energy, we can you chat, take on the challenges of some difficult uh, individuals. Uh, retaining the um, local knowledge um, and local expertise to figure out how to make that work best at the local level. And so, you know, those suggestions like that you've just put forward uh, increasing collective awareness of the social services uh, and other services that this community has at its disposal and maximizing their use is, is, is a key fundamental step. Board Member Barry. So, speaking again, um, serving back here to the just the key findings, you clarify is the median income, is that household, is that individual? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. My apologies. Um, through through you, Madam Chair. Um, I would have to go back and look through the report to get that to you, but um, I will I will um, do that if that is okay and get the information. Answer that question. I don't sure. have it at um, available at the moment. I believe in the census information. It's, it's household. It's household. Yeah. Okay, that's I kind of thought that too, but I wanted to make sure. Um, my other question was, I guess, through to I don't know if it's cited, I guess. Is there is there anything? Um, so I guess I'm going off what uh, Councilor Van Passen was saying. That this sort of follows the last survey. Those are the plays and opening. Is there it was there anything in this this um, assessment that was surprising or anything that is remarkable that we um, that is new that we should be, I guess, if you really wanted us to focus on, hey, there's this new thing. Is there anything in there that isn't following the consistency of previous assessments? To you, Madam Chair, so most of the findings, they are consistent with 2019 uh, community need assessment, but there are a few, uh, few areas where we, we, we should focus. So one of them is substance use and uh, mental health. So we'll be developing some plans for substance use and mental health of the community. I oddly enough, although I'm not a professional in your industry, would argue that substance abuse, while it certainly should always be a focus, when I look at these results, I would look at the data and go, I agree with Board member very brought up the the median income, so we know that we're lower than Hald Haldeman and we're lower than Ontario. But I don't look at that as a board of health issue. I look at that as a council and an economic development and job creation issue. I look at our employment rate; we're higher than the Ontario average. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that those are board of health priorities. Um, access to primary care is 63 physicians per 100,000 uh, residents in Haldeman and Norfolk compared to the 
provincial average of 115. So for me, that's a large priority, which I know we're always working on and certainly working on with a with a group right now. Um, I also look at, uh, although it may be the lowest statistic, it's probably the, the most concerning for me, 14.1% of respondents worried they didn't have enough money for food this month. Uh, again, I don't know what role the Board of Health plays in that specifically to deliver food to mouths, but there's got to be some kind of intermediary step where we're connecting with other agencies and groups and, and making sure everybody has food on their table. Um, and then of the remaining statistics, for me, from a priority perspective, 80.3% reported that Haldeman Norfolk needs more mental health services. So you, you said mental health is a priority. And then 81% reported that we need more affordable housing. Um, and then I guess through course of all of our priorities and executing on them would be addressing the 74.5% of, of survey respondents that don't even know what our health unit offers by way of services. So I guess that is kind of always ongoing business. But for me, I look at these results and the self-identified substance use, while I would never advocate to get rid of that programming, it's something that we need to do at all times. I look at access to primary care and physician recruitment, um, nutrition, food on the table, and um, mental health and housing as as our priorities personally when I review those results. So anyways, I think this is really, really great information. I think it's information that we should be um, maybe shared through our communications team and publicized throughout the community. We know that we're always trying to do the most that we can with a, with a small amount of funds and resources, but there are great community partners. Like this morning, I just toured Riverside 83 um, they're going to have church out serving programming, among other things. So there's a, a great way to bring food to families' mouths if um, it's a gap that we're not meeting right now. Uh, affordable housing, something that serious that, that Councillor Huffman and I are going to seriously address through the affordability roundtable. When that comes up, we can find synergies with our health unit. But um, I, I think if we don't share the information, we won't find those community groups to partner with on them. But uh, great report, really great information and some concerning statistics for sure. Dr. Luck? Yeah, three, Madam Chair. Uh, just to follow up on your statement, which uh, I'd like to acknowledge and agree with much of what was said. Um, the, um, so the role of public health is often um, part of our role is uh, awareness raising and advocacy. So that was part of the driving um, Know, objective behind drafting this report in the first place. So um, if, if you don't know, you can't do something about it. So by uh, we do know that factors, as I said earlier, such as income, education, um, you know, how connected you are with the community, on and on, are, are key issues that impact the ultimate welfare of the community citizens. Um, and that's why we do gather that data, uh, because it is a health indicator. Um, again, uh, there are far other experts than uh, myself and, and the other staff in the health who know how to, uh, you know, drive innovation and development in the in the employment and, and business sector. Um, but that said, uh, we do uh, try our best to keep our finger on the pulse of initiatives in this area and to be able to advocate uh, in support of these initiatives whenever the um, opportunity arise. So the, uh, the Council of Medical Officers of Health does regularly connect with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario uh, because often uh, many of our interests are very common. Um, and uh, so, uh, I do think that, and that's why the uh, need for collaboration across sectors is so important uh, because none of us, not, no sector on its own can really move these issues forward. Yep, I fully agree. Thank you very much. Um, okay, with that, I'm not seeing any other hands, so I'm looking for someone to move the staff recommendation. Board Member Banadrishi seconded by. Board Member Huffman, all in favor? Carried. We have no bylaws. We have no motions. Are there any notices of motion today? Does any board member have any other business? OK, we have one closed session item today. Um, 
do we have 10, 12 minutes before we need to start public hearings? Are we able to? Okay. All right, let's. Uh, I need a motion to move into closed session 2.48 p.m. by board member Vanadrichi, seconded by board member Barry. To pursuant, uh, sorry, HSS 23027 Ontario Senior Dental Care Program Overview and Service Implementation Request pursuant to the Municipal Act 2001, Section 239-2K, a physician plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or uh, on behalf of the municipality or local board. All in favor? My name is Jim Toombs. I'm an Associate Purchasing Specialist here at Toyo Tetsu, also known as TTCA. Here at Toyo Tetsu, we're responsible for supplying Toyota with car parts, mainly automotive frame for the Lexus, the Corolla, and other Toyota models. I started here in May of 2016. I was in welding. Here I am two years later, and I'm a salaried position. The job itself is it's challenging. There are challenges in what I have to do every day, and for that I enjoy it. It's not monotonous day in, day out. There's new challenges that I'm confronted with and new tasks that I have to do. A high school student who's like, I'm not sure, I think this is an excellent opportunity to kind of answer that question for themselves. They can see what kind of the working world is like, as well as pick up skills. There are plenty of opportunities here. For example, for me, I was in welding, but that didn't mean I had to stay there. There's opportunities in stamping, where you'd learn different skills entirely. PC, again, the same thing, some different skills needed that you'd learn. Though we make car parts and they're welded, there are a lot of departments and areas that support that. My name's Aaron Pace. I'm a yard manager here at Townsend Lumber. We are a sawmill that produces lumber. We make anywhere from rail ties to timber frame home products, kill dried lumber, which is used for wood cabinets and uh, furniture. We also do pallet components, and we also do stakes for farming. We ship container loads to the Middle East, we ship it to Asia. We have gone to Mexico, Singapore. We've shipped to many different locations. My father has worked here for 30 years. He got me a part-time job as a summer student. I started as a regular piler, as a laborer at the entry level position and with hard work and dedication I have been promoted through the system and it took nine years to become a supervisor. I enjoy the freedom of the job, like uh, outside working with the heavy industrial stuff, talking to the range of customers and the way we produce things for them. My name is Cam Kirkwood, I'm a production supervisor at Superior Essex in uh, Simcoe. We make uh, magnet wire and cable for the transformer industries. Our magnet wire products are found all around you that most people don't even notice in uh, winding motors and alternators in your vehicles, transformers on the side of the road or on top of poles. I've been here at the company for 15 years. I started on the floor as a machine operator for seven years and then I did a stint in engineering for about a year and then I moved on to production supervisor for the last seven. One of the best parts about working here is it is a build-to-order shop, so although we do make the similar products every day, it's very unique. We don't always see the same orders, there's always new challenges. One of the best parts about being in manufacturing for me is the uh, ship work. So it provides an opportunity for you to adjust to do your own life on your days off or you can pursue other interests. A lot of people have uh, second businesses or hobbies that they really enjoy. There is lots of opportunity to advance. Uh, there's educational assistance programs. You can continue to learn new skills and advance to a new area if you were so desired. There's a great opportunity moving up the manufacturing sector. Try it, because you're going to learn a lot about the working world as well as yourself.
Welcome to Passionate Folks, a blog and video series where I'll be highlighting people from Norfolk County who have a passion, who are involved in our community, who are the movers and shakers. So I'm excited to introduce every month somebody new from Norfolk that will bring you their story, their passion, and share it all with us. Come on in. All right, welcome to the first episode of Passionate Folks. I'm Emily, and I love to dig in people's life and getting to know more about them. I'm here with Jess today. Thanks, Jess, for showing up. Thank you for having me. It's yes. so exciting. Uh, so just for the people that don't know you, introduce yourself. Tell me a little bit more about you and the person that you are. Sure. Um, well, my name's Jess, and I grew up in Waterford, more specifically Boston, more specifically Bill's Corners. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a passionate Norfolk advocate. I love this area. I love theater. I love music. I love anything arts related. I'm also a passionate advocate for entrepreneurs in the area. Uh, so I invited you to pick a location in Norfolk that meant something to you. Uh, so tell us where we are and why you picked this place. All right, we are here in Simcoe Little Theater. Um, it's on Tal the corner, corner of Talbot and Young in downtown Simcoe. And this place, Simcoe Little Theater, is a very special place to me. I spent most of my life in these walls, um, on that stage, behind the stage, in these seats, like everywhere in this space. Um, it's something that theater is something that's like a big, has always been a big part of my life since I was about eight years old. Um, you mentioned to me that you also in high school, you were really involved into the drama program and all that, so. I had walked the halls of my high school and I had seen so many pictures on the wall of different shows they had done throughout the years, but nobody was doing shows anymore. And I was like really bummed about that. So in grade 10, me and my girlfriends, we got, um, we roped all our moms in. <laughs> we were like, if we start doing high school shows, like, will you guys help? Will you make costumes? Will you whatever? And they all jumped everybody in. Involved. Yeah. Love that, right? Like, that's a small community, like, that's everybody it. coming in together. And like, that's what it requires, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it, a show is like a mini village coming together, like, making all the pieces happen. So this community, I think the word that like, you keep repeating it, and I think what you're creating in Groundswell is the, that sub-community within the community, and, and that really stands out. So would you say this is something that you're really passionate about? Is oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, you, that connection, totally. right? Totally. Yeah. I just think, like, community is everything. We're not meant to do, we're not meant to live life alone, hmm. I don't think. Um, and I don't mean, like, you have to necessarily have a romantic partner to live a life, but just have people around you that get you. That you don't have to explain yourself. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You just walk in the room and they're happy to see you. That's it. <laughs> That's always such a good feeling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like you just have those people that, you know, believe in you too, right? Yeah. And, and just cheerleaders. Yeah. So I see, Jess, you're always involved in this community. Like you're volunteering places. You, you really want this place to grow and thrive. And so, so why Norfolk? And what do you love so much about this place? Oh, man. I think... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question. It's a combination of things. I think um, the the geography that we live in, you know, the nature we have around us, that is a huge benefit of being in Norfolk. But it's also the people here. Um, <laughs> and that's why I'm so obsessed with community because we have so many beautiful people who live here with ideas, with talents, um, with love and vision. And I think that's what excites me. It's like, just because we're a small town doesn't mean we have small ideas or small impact. I want to bring some of the music piece because I know we've been talking a lot about the, the theater and acting, but I know that music is so important to you. Yes. And a big part yes. of your life. Yes. So tell me a bit more about your maybe influences and, and uh, what, what makes you feel alive in music. Just like theater, you know, I, I love performing music too. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there's something really cool about being on stage. Like that, I was, uh, before I came here today, I was like, thinking about how alive I feel when I'm on stage. Mm -hmm. And I think that everyone kind of looks for that thing that makes them feel alive. Yeah. So for me, it's that. Awesome, so I thank you so much, Jess, for taking the time to meet with me. Uh, there's gonna be more feature of passionate, uplifting community people through this uh, little video series. So keep watching. Thanks, Jess. Thank, thank you. So oh my Yay. God. Yeah. <laughs> this is so much fun. Awesome. <laughs>
welcome to episode two of Passionate Folks. I'm Emily. I love to ask questions, learn about people, get some connections. I'm here with Kiri today. Thank you for having me. I've been chatting with you and I got to know you a little bit more, but for folks that don't know you, maybe introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Kiri Bokno. I live here in Waterford. I've lived here for over 15 years. I'm married. I got two kids and I just love the community. Mm-hmm. From our conversation today, there's a lot of uh, the community word showed up quite a few times so <laughs> I'm a believer of you know when you when I moved into Waterford I thought wow it's you know what if we get involved then you learn so much more and you meet so many different people I mean people that I know if I wouldn't have met otherwise yes so I asked you to pick a location Carrie and so tell us where we are and why you picked it I picked the uh, Waterford Heritage Agriculture Museum Wham. Um, because uh, in a couple summers we will be building our skateboard park here, mm-hmm. so it's kind of a yeah. yeah let's nice let's show. <laughs> Not that I wore the shirt or anything, but yes, this will be our future location on the other side. Talking about passion and passionate people, what what do you think your passion is? My passion is youth. I <laughs> I love kids. You know what? There's no such thing as a bad kid. Kids make bad decisions. And as a you know the old saying, it takes a village to raise a child. And I truly believe that. You know what? We give kids, you know, that opportunity and show them that we, that we support them and that, you know what, that we're there for them and they'll make the right decisions. Mm-hmm. I, I made a stop at her business. She has a business downtown Waterford and uh, I was seeing that you, your family works there, your friends, your best friend is My best is, friend is with me. Is Both with best you. friends, yes. So this tight-knit community feel is really important. To you. When I was given my dream and somebody said to me, here, I'll help you you know create your dream and I thought okay karma (laughs) so this is somebody saying to me it's my opportunity to use this to give back if I have a restaurant nobody should be hungry I want kids to feel like they can come in and say you know I I need something or I need a drink or you know whatever I've been doing this for 30 years and the kids that I trained 30 years ago still come back to find me and they come back and they tell me what they've been doing and (laughs) I guess the biggest thing is people don't realize sometimes the simplest thing can change a kid's life. It is a ripple effect, don't you It is, you know what, and I mean, so I get to see their, like, I mean, I'm feel god i feel old when i start seeing them coming with their kids and i start seeing you know like that they've you know that they've gone through and they're going to university or they're doing this or they've done this or done that and that makes me feel like you know what i had a piece of that you know just by being involved in their life maybe i made a little bit of a difference so you're an entrepreneur you're super involved in the community you're a mom you have a lot on the go so if i ask you what do you do to de-stress and let go I go, to, I like to go to the gym, I like to, um, you know, boot camp, yoga, um, I try to take, you know, a few hours a week for me, yes. and it's just about me, and I, I, I honestly think anybody who's really busy, I think, needs to learn, it took me 48 years to figure it out, <laughs> but... Never too late. Never too late. Too As I said, I can go to the gym, and I can be having the world's hardest day, and I always say I leave it on the mat. Love. So I, when I walk out of there, I feel like a completely, totally different person. Leave it on the mat. So other than that, when you're in Norfolk, like what else do you love to do? What, what's your favorite spot or place that you like to visit or something you love to do? Love to go on the trails. I love going fishing on the ponds. Um, I just, you know, I just, Waterford, I just, I love we have so many little places to go and see and do and, and What's stuff. happening in this community? You know what there is and I mean the thing is is we don't really I mean I laugh because there's so many of us who don't see what's here. They're right here. I mean <laughs> Whistling Gardens, Bonnie Heath, we have all the wineries and stuff. Museum. The museum. Like there's so many places to go where you can have a staycation mm-hmm. without leaving Norfolk. Yes. So thank you so much, Gary, for joining me today and being part of this uh, blog and video series. I invite you to check it on every month. There will be somebody new, a new story, a new connection. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Welcome to Passionate Folks, a blog and video series about the people of Norfolk. People that are involved in our community, people that bring a lot of energy. So this is about a conversation, this is about their story. So welcome to episode 3. Welcome to Passionate Folks. I'm Emily. I love to dig in people's lives, ask questions, and learn about people's passion. Today I'm here with Adam. Hi, Adam. Hi, how are you doing, Emily? Great. I'm happy that you're here taking the time to sit down with me today. Uh, so I've known you for a little bit. Uh, you know, small community, but people that don't know you. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. So my name is Adam Van Passen. I grew up here in Norfolk County. I was born onto a farm and I got to work on that farm growing up, which was a great learning experience from a young age. I got to understand what hard work was and what it was to be close to nature. So that was very cool for me uh, growing up like that. I, my dad also was a counselor for Haldeman Norfolk and he had a big part in shaping what is today Norfolk County. So I got to see that and watching him and experiencing him work through that really sparked an interest in me for the county and what it could become. Great. So not like the typical kids, we hear most high schoolers like just ready to get out of their hometowns and go explore the city and something else and it doesn't sound like that's your story. Not at all. I heard a lot of kids saying that they wanted to move on to bigger, better things and I just really didn't have that feeling. I always thought the biggest, best things were here in Norfolk to start. So you, I asked you to pick a location today and you bring me to a, a place that I don't know very well in Norfolk. Yeah. So tell me what, about where we are and why you picked it. This is a very cool spot. Uh, I know a lot of people drive by it, maybe on their way to Long Point or into Port Rowan, but this is Boos Harbor. So I grew up on Boos Harbor. My best friend, his family owned this place. So I grew up here hanging out, relaxing, boating, going out fishing, going out hunting. I worked here for a while. I did some volunteer work for the Shriners Club here, doing some chicken barbecues. So I really got to experience Norfolk and how community comes together. There's a lot of people that take up their summer residence here mm -hmm. in uh, trailers. And it's very cool to see all these people that are coming from other places in Ontario to enjoy what Norfolk has to offer. So it's just very cool to see that and experience it. One very cool fact about this place is that Boost Harbor has the largest amount of indoor boat storage on boat houses for all of the world. The world? Yes. Wow, that is crazy. This little place. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Very cool. Something to be proud of. I would absolutely say so. So we've been talking about nature. I know you spend lots of time outside. You bring me to a boating place where you like to fish and, and spend time. So tell me about your passion. Obviously, there's a connection somewhere there. Yes, absolutely. I. Uh... Especially recently with uh, everything that I've been seeing happen in the world, I'm very passionate about the earth. So I want the earth to be a good place. I want Norfolk County to be a good place. Everything that I love about Norfolk has to do with outside, has to do with nature, has to do with clean water, clean air, fresh trees, everything. So I just really think it's important to take care of everything that we have here in Norfolk County. And it's not an easy thing to do. So no. We all um, have to start and do our part, that's the thing, right? Absolutely. And I'm doing my best, but it does get very difficult. It's easy to make the change, it's just hard to start. Um, so we were talking earlier about, you know, doing things around Norfolk and, and visiting places. I know you're a busy guy, like you work, you're a volunteer firefighter. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you do to de-stress and, and, and relax? I would say my number one most favorite thing to do to de-stress would be to just get out on Lake Erie. Whether that's ice fishing, fishing, boating, swimming, relaxing, it's just such an amazing place. As soon as you get on, out on Lake Erie and you get away from shore a little bit, you just come out to this different zone. Other than this place, like what, uh, where else do you like to visit in Norfolk County? Where else? What, uh, what's one of your other so favorite spots? So I would say that my favorite spots in Norfolk County would have to be broken into two categories. One is nature, being Lake Erie, boating, all of that mm -hmm. kind of fun outdoor stuff. And I also like Norfolk's bounty. Before, maybe you had to go out to a place far away to enjoy all of this beer, wine, food, amazing service. But now we can just go out the back door. And before I can drive for 10 minutes, I found something that I can go to yeah, locally that's couple, amazing. Couple of winery and, on the way here. Yeah, it <laughs> has passionate folks in it doing things. <laughs> like, it's just great. All, all around here, there's so many amazing things you can do, and it's just growing. So I love seeing that. I thank you so much for your time. I, I love your connection with nature and what you want to do as far as your passion with the environment. I, I'm in line. We, we need to come together for this to happen. So hopefully we can inspire a few people with this little conversation here. So Absolutely. thanks, Adam. Cool. Thank you very much. We'll for see you soon. Time. Yeah. <laughs>
Welcome to Passionate Folks, a blog and video series about the people of Norfolk. It's about people that have high energy that get involved in their community. We sit down, have a conversation, learn about their passions. Welcome to the next episode. Hello, I'm Emily. Welcome to Passionate Folks. I love to ask questions and discover people's passion and having great conversations. So today I'm here with Nick. Hi, Nick. Hi. Might be you here, might be you inviting me to a great place. Um, I got to know you a little bit more today, but I'd love you to tell us a little bit more about you. Sure. Uh, so I'm Nick Pranks. Um, I was raised in uh, Langton and uh, I live in St. Williams now. So uh, Norfolk County boy. Yeah, Norfolk County boy. <laughs> yeah. If, if we're going to put a, a location on it, and if you're asking someone where you're from, uh, this area, you always say Norfolk County. Unless you're from Port Dover. <laughs> then you say Port Dover. <laughs> then you say Port Dover for some reason. <laughs> I invited you to pick a place. Uh, so tell us where we are and why you decided to invite me here. So we're at where I work, uh, Blue Bear Hill Estates, uh, which my family owns as well, too. Uh, this is where I spend probably my entire day, every day of the year. So we're located on the patio here and we're basically overlooking the patch. And uh, you probably cannot see from the camera because it's on the other side of the camera, but the lake is just on the other side. Um, I love to hear about people's passion, and I know you have a lot of projects going on, and I want to dig further into your passion. So what do you think really stands out for you? What are, what are you really passionate about? Uh, so day in, day out, I'm typically uh, making wine um, or working in the field, so that's something I'm really passionate about. I'm also the president of the Ontario South Coast Wineries and Growers Association, which encompasses Norfolk along with other uh, neighboring counties. And so I'm really passionate about trying to raise awareness of this area for growing grapes and making uh, world-class wines. And so winemaking, like what draws you to it? Why are you making your whole life right now? And, and why winemaking in Norfolk County? Well, I guess you could say it's one of the best uh, agricultural products you can make. Uh, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's something that you can preserve, and like even after the crop is finished, you still have to work with the crop that you were working out in the field all year round. And, and when you put it in a glass of wine, or you, ate, you have memories of how that year was when, when that, that wine was made. Uh, so it sounds like you spend a lot of time on this farm, a lot of time on this like part of Norfolk <laughs> County, but if you have to time to de-stress, where would you go? What do you do in Norfolk? I definitely like going to the beach. Um, so, you know, getting out in the water when it's a hot day is, uh, uh, is truly nice. Uh, Not too far from Turkey Point, I guess. Yeah, you can yeah. roll down the hill. Yeah, or... we, we got uh, excellent restaurants here too, So, uh, which is pretty amazing for the per capita, the amount of people that live in Norfolk County that we have enough restaurants we can count them uh, more than your two hands or whatever which is really nice. good ones too right yeah like, exactly <laughs> it's so it's exciting to see how our agro tourism industry is developing in our area and, and it's kind of cool to see you guys like working together and really promoting this area well when you think about farming uh from what it was in the past uh, it has to evolve over time though to make it um an industry that can support itself and allows people to be able to figure out ways to uh, succeed or have succession in their family um, to go to that next generation so that way we can have countless more generations of those families living in Norfolk County growing the things that their grandparents grew. And keeping the passion alive. Exactly, yeah. I thank you so much for your time, Nick. I, no I thank you for inviting me in this beautiful place. I cannot wait to explore some more. And... It's too bad it's not pizza today. <laughs> no, I heard that was really yeah. good. <laughs> I'll come back. I'll be back. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. No worries. Cheers. Welcome to episode 6 of Passionate Folks. This is a blog and video series about the people of Norfolk. We sit down, have a conversation, hear about their passion and what lights them up. I'm excited to introduce the next guest.
Welcome to Passionate Folks. My name is Emily. I love to connect with people, having some conversation and learning about people's passion. Today I'm sitting here with Sue. Hey Sue. Yeah, you bet. I'm so glad that you took the time to come out and have a conversation with me. Well, thanks for asking me. Yeah, so for people that don't know you, can you start with introducing yourself, where you live, where you're from, and a little bit more about you? Okay, sure. Uh, my name is Sue Downs. I uh, live in Simcoe, uh, born and raised here. And I work for the Simcoe Reformer newspaper and started there way back in 1988. So, and uh, love my job, love Norfolk County, and was really pleased that uh, Emily asked me to be part of this. Oh. I think. <laughs> so far, so good. So far, so good, yeah. So far, so good. Great. So, as always, Sue, I, I ask a guest to pick a location so we can explore it and discover a hidden gem in Norfolk County. And this one is, is a little bit different. So, tell me where we are and, and why you brought me here. So, Go we're on. at uh, Norfolk County Fair. We're at the bottom of the uh, Junior Farmers Building. And so why, why do you pick the fair? What, what's so special about the fair to you? Um, I think for myself, Norfolk County Fair is like one of the largest events that happen in Norfolk County um, every year. Uh, it's always been near and dear to my heart. Like I think uh, so many childhood memories. It's all about tradition. Um, for us growing up, at my age, I've only missed one fair in all of my years. And that was when I was in, in Timmins. So um, I just love the fact that you can come to the fair. There's so much excitement. There's always lots of things to see and do. Like family would come home during Thanksgiving weekend. And I think that still happens today, right? Like it's all about tradition and all about community, which I feel like I'm pretty passionate about. Yeah, so we're just going to ask you a little bit more about your passion. I see you a lot being involved in the community and supporting local businesses. And it seems like it's, it's really important to you and close to your heart. Uh, I'd like to promote local as much as possible. So whenever we go out for dinner, a lot of people go, do you ever stay home? Because you'll constantly see posts on social media, on Facebook or on Twitter. And it's like, you know, we're at the barrel, we're doing this, we're at Long Point Eco Adventure, we're, you know. It's so good that you're taking the time to promote those local businesses and, and support. And I remember when I started my business, you were one of the, the big supporter of sharing what I was doing. And I know a lot of people have felt the love that you give oh. to entrepreneurs. So I want to thank you for that. Oh, well, you're welcome, but it does make you feel good, and it is it is important. I feel that you know if we can, you know, support each other as much as possible. Like it's 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 again, it's all about giving back. So Norfolk County and specifically Simcoe has changed quite a lot. We are moving in a different direction in our county. So from you like growing up in Simcoe and in the downtown, and what's happening around now, like. What's the highlights for you? Um, okay, well, the highlight growing up was always, um, you know, going downtown on the weekend. People that are watching this that are my age would remember you <laughs> used to be able to go to the Tartan restaurant and Woolworths and different places down there. Um, but I think a lot of the exciting thing that I see now is a lot of the collaborations that are mm -hmm. happening within Norfolk County. No, it was not in motion. Okay, welcome everyone. Running a couple of minutes behind, I apologize. So uh, I'd like to welcome all members of and guests to the May 2nd, 2023 Public Hearing Committee meeting. I'd like to remind, oh, thank you, sorry. I think I've, no, I didn't, here they are. You're right, sorry. So um, I'll turn it over to the clerk to read because I was gonna say direction. Okay, mover and a seconder, moved by board member Van Passen, seconded by board member Van Andrishi to reconvene at 3.17 p.m. And then Madam Clerk, will you please uh, read our motion? Thank you, Mayor. Um, in closed session, uh, the Board of Health directed staff to proceed. Thank you. The Board of Health directed staff to proceed with um, implementing option number three of the closed session report. Okay. 
Yeah, I think we can. We just said option three. Okay, so moved by board member Van Passen. Uh, I believe we also received the reporter's information. Received his information. Correctly, yeah. Vote on option three. Moved by board member Van Passen, seconded by board member Vary. All those in favor? And opposed? The motion is carried. Okay, and adjournment. 3.18 p.m. Moved by board member Huffman, seconded by board member Barry. All in favor? Confirming bylaw. Good thing you're here. Board member Van Passen seconded by board member Barry. All in favor? And now we are adjourning Board of Health at 3.19 p.m. Moved by board member Hoffman, seconded by board member Columbus. All in favor? Okay, perfect. We're back on track. We're going to jump over to our public hearing meeting now. So uh, I'd like to remind everyone that our meetings are web streamed and televised. And I would ask you to ensure that your phones are on silent mode. For those attending virtually, please mute yourself when not speaking. When called upon to speak, please turn on your camera and unmute yourself. For staff in attendance, please use the Microsoft Teams hand raise feature and remove it when you're finished speaking. And with that, I call the public hearing committee meeting to order. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, Councillor Michelle is joining us virtually and we still have regrets from Councillor Duff. Uh, I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda. Councillor Vandendree, she moves, seconded by. Councillor Columbus, all in favor? Carried. And with that, I'll officially open the public meeting under the Municipal Act, held under the Municipal Planning Act and County Policy. Please be advised that to preserve your right to appeal the Ontario Land Tribunal, you're required to make comments or provide written submissions prior to the passing of a bylaw. So that's for everyone in the audience here. If you wanna preserve your right to appeal, you need to provide us with written comments or verbal comments here today. These meetings are to allow the public to provide initial comments on presented planning matters and no formal decision is being made today. With that, we'll jump right into agenda item 4.1, which is the silos of Waterford, CD 23036. Uh, Mr. Sloan, welcome. Thank you and good afternoon, Madam Chair. So we have uh, Mohammed and Trisha are here live and in person to present this item. And then I believe the applicant also has a presentation related to this app the applications. So I'll turn it over to Mohammed. Thank you, Brandon. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and the Councillors. We received a development proposal for 3.49 hectare lands located at the west end of Waterfront uh, urban boundary. I know. West Church Street, McCool Street, and Nicol Street on three sides, and um, Waterford Trail at the west side. The subject lands are currently considered as an underutilized industrial site with a warehouse storage building and a bus depot. Uh, there are also 13 abandoned um, silos formerly used for agricultural supply depot. The surrounding areas are basically in the phase of a transformation from historical industrial activities to residential intensification. There are a number of residential development proposals are under review at this moment for a wide range of housing types, including uh, semi-detached dwellings, street townhouses, condominium developments. Uh, these are some of the lands that are surrounding this land. Um, the remaining industrial sites and mostly warehouse and storage facilities. There are a few institutional lands located at the north side of the subject lands. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. And the next slide, please. So Madam Chair, uh, the subject lands are designated as industrial in the official plan and zoned as general industrial in the zoning bylaw. Therefore, to permit this development, an official plan amendment will be required to change the designation from industrial to urban residential. And the zoning bylaw amendment will be required to change the zoning from general industrial to various types of urban residential zones. 
uh, in accordance with different types of housing. Uh, next slide, please. There are three components of this proposal. The first one is an official plan amended to change the land use designation from industrial to urban residential. I just wanted to point out that this is not a protected industrial zone. The industrial designation that are not designated as a protected site are those which are generally older industrial sites and mostly underutilized and poorly situated to attract new industrial um, investment. Generally, these areas are located near to residential areas. The conversion of these lands to other uses which are more compatible to the neighborhood context is generally encouraged in the official plan. The second component of this proposal is a zoning by amendment, which will change the zoning from general industrial to urban residential type 1B that will permit 16 single detached lots with provision for secondary dwelling units. Urban residential type 4 for 76 towns. Among them, there are 52 town, uh, townhouse units for, with uh, two-story stack towns and 24 units within three-story stack towns. Uh, and the next one is urban residential type 6 for 164 apartment dwelling consisting of 14 studios units. 27 one bed units, 87 two bed units, and uh, 28 one plus 10, and eight paint penthouse units. Um, the application also requested for a special provision to get some relief. And this relief includes additional commercial uses within this uh, residential zone that will permit restaurant special uh, food shop, daycare, retail store, clinic and doctor's office, pharmacy, office space, uh, place of assembly and place of worship, bike repair shop. So it, it's not identified yet what are the uses will be proposed, but these are the provisions um, the applicant wants to include within the bylaw. Uh, the other provision includes a reduced number of parking space only for one bedroom and studio apartments from 1.5 space to one space per unit. So the total required residential parking is 430, uh, 405 is provided. And the total visitor parking is 80 and no reduction is proposed. So it will be 80 as per the requirement. Uh, there is also a subdivision application associated with this proposal. Uh, the subdivision app application is basically required to divide the lands um, with 16 single digit lots and one block for the condominium. And that condominium will uh, include the stack towns and apartment buildings. So if we go to the next slide, please. So we received several supporting documents with the application that includes uh, planning justification report, urban design brief, a phase one environmental site assessment, a functional servicing and stormwater management report, a traffic impact study. The phase one um, environmental in, uh, site assessment determined that a phase two assessment would be required. Um, the staff will require a record of site condition as a condition for its approval uh, to ensure that potential contamination is remediated in accordance with uh, the provincial guidelines. The traffic impact study forecasted 74 and 90 trips during uh, the peak hours and identified projected background traffic conditions for up to 2036. Um, no traffic update is proposed. The applicant, uh, the application is deemed complete on April 6th. We did not receive any technical comments and public formal public input as of yet. We'll analyze all staff comments and include the public comment in the future recognition report. Next slide, please. The proposal would be one of the largest development in Waterford with a high density of 73 units per hectare. The critical preliminary considerations include traffic generation, compatibility of mix of housing units, proposed commercial services, uh, confirmation of any amenities such as parks and playgrounds, servicing capacity and conveyance, and the compliance of the environmental assessment. Um, next slide, please. 
So our next step would be receiving our staff comments and public input followed by a recommendation report. Staff recommends this report uh, for official plan and general amendment and substitution applications received for information and any um, public comments um, is received as part of this uh, meeting considered for future recommendation report. That's everything from me. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from committee to staff? Seeing none, um, staff, so I'd like to confirm. So there's a request for a reduction on the one bedroom unit parking spots from 1.5 per down to one, which results in 25 spaces. Uh, through my down chair, correct. And this would be a condo corporation. This would be a condo corporation. We, uh, it's not decided yet whether it will be one condo or two condo, but uh, the stack towns and the apartments will be under a condo corporation. So we don't um, own or enforce parking issues on the roads inside the condo corporation. Uh, within the condo uh, development, there will be private roads, which will not be able to park on the road because there will be a parking bylaw that will not allow any because the right of way is smaller than the public street. So um, unlike the public street, there'll be no parking on the road. Or the it's, my, it's my understanding that our bylaw can't go in and enforce a no parking bylaw in a condo corporation. Uh, so therefore, uh, if there's a sh what I'm getting at basically is if there's a shortage of parking spots and there's more cars parked on the road because we've permitted 25 less parking spaces that when we start to get complaints, we can't assist. In the condo corporation, um, although it is a private development, uh, there is a provincial bylaw. If, if if there are parking signs provided on the private road, which says there is no parking because of the fire route, uh, they will, I mean, the user cannot park actually on the private road because of that bylaw. Um, it happens when the right of way is smaller and generally the parking, it, generally the road does not have enough space to provide parking. So we can still enforce that. Okay. The commercial uses on the property. Have our staff given any consideration to um, the proposed uses that I read here are great. I'm in full support of them. But has our staff given any consideration to if those uses are not fulfilled, um, that we've created a small parcel of commercial space off the beaten path of the already zoned commercial spaces in the downtown area? Um, I'm just, I'm always cautious and I, I'm not an expert on this, so this may not happen, but I'm always cautious about creating separate urban centers or, or separate commercial districts. Similarly, we hear all the time here in Simcoe about Norfolk Street and Queensway. So it's not comparable because it's a significantly small parcel size, but what happens if the development is not able to go forward with the commercial uses as stated on the document? Uh, through Madam Mayor, uh, that can be addressed to the zoning by now. We can we can provide a provision that certain amount of space has to be commercial. Uh, it can be restricted to a certain size as well. Uh, right now, uh, the bylaw is drafted as it is optional, but we can also provide a condition that there must have some specific area of commercial uh, use on that and the specific uses uh, on the development. And then are we able to do the same thing with the park space? Uh, the same thing we can do at the park uh, for the park space. Correct. Okay. Any other questions? No, Councillor Flores, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mohammed, what is the uh, the, the stack townhouses? What's the frontage on this per unit in feet? So, since it will be through Madam Mayor to the councillor, since it will be a condominium development, um, the bylaw will be written as if the whole site has one lot. Um, so. The frontage will not be addressed in the bylaw, but through the site plan application, we can um, we can control site and frontage uh, for for the stack towers. And 
we're taking away industrial land, which uh, we're in fairly short supply, but do we have to find another 3.47 hectares somewhere else in the county to offset the this going to residential from industrial? To Madam Mayor, to the councillor, um, the industrial side is, I mentioned already that it's not a protected industrial side. So through our optional plot policy, Right now, we don't have tools to identify an additional uh, space for industrial. Um, the policy also mentions that many of these industrial sites are actually underutilized and new industrial activities are not attractive because of their location. Uh, and that's why there are so many transformation is happening in Waterford in these areas. Thank you. Any other questions from council to staff? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, to just after you, the 16 uh, single family homes that uh, they talk about potential for the accessory dwelling units to go in them, is there enough parking space uh, like to provide the extra space if the homeowners decide to make an ADU? Or do, or do we have to get rid of a couple houses and spread them out a little farther? To uh, Madam Mayor, to the councillor, um, the single detached dwellings, as the site plan provided, um, it, it is apparent that there are enough parking space for an additional dwelling unit. Um, the driveway are quite wide compared to um, standard um, single detached houses. So, based on the drawing, we see it, it, it seems like there will be enough space for it. Uh, providing one more parking. Okay, seeing any further hands, we have one registered speaker for this item. Uh, Mr. Valley, do you have a, a slide deck? That can get that ready for you. And I would just remind you, you have five minutes time limit. Thank you, Your Worship, and members of council. I'll, I'll try really hard to stick to your five minutes. Uh, you've already heard from your planner, but we would like to make five key points to you today. One, uh, if I can have the next slide, please. One is that we are providing cost-effective housing through this development and an enormous range of different housing styles, which are unique to Waterford and I would say unique to Norfolk County. The second point is your official plan, as your planner has said to you, actually encourages the trans transformation of this land from industrial to residential designation. We also want to show you how we have considered mass and density and scaling of the development, and we have a transition so that we start off at the periphery of our development at the edges with a low density and low height and gradually increase that as we move across the development. By the time we get to our mid-rise building, we are almost exactly the same height and location as the existing silos that are there today. We are proposing some accessory uses, as you've heard, and we think that's important to, for development of this community. And lastly, we meet all the tests of Norfolk County from your official plan and from the province on its uh, quest for additional housing. If I could have the next slide, please. Your own official plan designates this property as industrial. It's an industrial designation. What you see on the slide is the first paragraph in your official plan under the heading industrial designation. What's important here is that this designation applies to poorly situated industrial lands that are generally in conflict with the neighborhood and are typically near residential areas. And that's exactly what we have here. The, the section in blue is the key sentence here, is the conversion of lands that are designated industrial to other uses that are more compatible with the neighborhood is encouraged. You don't find those words in your official plan very often, is encouraged. You find is permitted, but you don't find encouraged very often. So this is the intention of these industrial lands that they be converted. And I think that's really important. Can I have the next slide, please? What you see here is the map of Waterford 
The yellow area is uh, the area that's designated residential. So that's most of the town. The blue box is our site. So you can see that we are virtually surrounded by existing residential lands. And there's a little red box down in the bottom right corner of the blue. That red box is the property uh, the subject of the McCool Street application that was before you a couple of weeks ago. And this council changed that designation to residential. So that is that in essence now also yellow. So you can see that we are surrounded by residential lands and the Norfolk County official plan encourages us to change this designation to be more compatible with the neighborhood. What this application does is it implements, it doesn't comply with, it implements your official plan. If I could have the next slide, please. This is a layout of the overall development. And as Mohammed explained to you, it is in two components. The right hand side on your screen, which is has a sort of a pink background, if you will, up against McCool Street is a plan of subdivision. These are 16 lots. Each lot would contain a single detached dwelling, and each one of those dwellings has the potential to create an accessory dwelling unit in the basement. That is the subdivision. The balance of the site, which has the white background, is all plan of condominium. There are a bunch of different land types here. The blue boxes are what we're referring to as building B. These are two story stacked dwellings with a garage and a form a, a very different home style than what is in Norfolk today. You have a dwelling unit on the ground floor that sh with a garage and then up above you have a separate dwelling unit, a different unit that goes over the garage and over the dwelling unit. So it's much larger. Then we have in the middle, we have these boxes that are part purple and I'll call them part orange. The orange part is a three story stacked dwelling unit. And at the back of those units are pur the purple units, what we refer to as D, are small scale round level dwelling units that would be uh, definitely geared towards more affordability. When you get into building E, which is our condominium uh, mid-rise building, this is an eight story building and it has a wide range of units, everything from studios, one bedrooms, one bedrooms with extra bedrooms, bath, uh, sorry, penthouse, a wide variety in there, again, appealing to a wide range of market type. What's important here is that overall, there are nine different housing styles within this development. And I want to flash you back a couple of weeks when we talked about the McCool Street project. There, there was a big discussion about ADUs in the basements of the townhouses. Norfolk County's bylaw says that an ADU can only be a certain percentage of the main dwelling. Don't quote me, but I think it's 45%. That would result in those ADUs being around 670 square feet. So we looked at this proposal because we know the council was very interested in creation of these smaller dwelling types. We looked at this proposal and said, how many units do we have that would be the same size or smaller than the ADUs we talked about two weeks ago? So we did a count, and that's in the blue box up in the top right of your screen. So we have the 16 ADUs that would be in the plan of subdivision. We have 26 units in, in um, the blue boxes in B. Those would be the ground floor levels, the smaller units that have a bigger one above. We have the purple units, which are uh, the ground floor of the stack townhouses. And we have some studio units in the uh, in the mid rise building and some one bedrooms in the mid rise building. When you add all that up, we have 90 units in this development proposal that are the same size or smaller than those ADUs we talked about at McCool Street. So there we were talking about should, can we have four? Can we have eight? How can this work? We need more housing that is more affordable to the public. Here we're talking about 90 units that would fit in that same category. So this is where we think it's really important that we're providing this range of housing styles. If you could go to the next slide, please. This is a perspective drawing that illustrates the size, massing, scale, and so on of the development. So you'll notice on the front edge, the ones closest to the viewer, that's McCool Street where we have single family, two-story dwellings. Very typical of what's in the neighborhood. 
very compatible. Behind those, we have two-story townhouses. Again, a low density, low height. As you move back into the core, you're into three-story dwellings. And then in the back corner, you have the mid-rise building. Again, same height as the, as the silos that are there today and the same location. About 30 seconds remaining, Mr. Miller. Okay, I might, I might have to ask for a little forgiveness. Um, next slide, please. We're familiar with the residential land uses. We've talked about that. There's a whole series of accessory dwelling or accessory land uses as well here. The list is there uh, and answer any questions on that that you'd like. Next slide. We've done a lot of studies that are contained within our application. I would draw your attention to the traffic study, especially to note that West Church Street today is designated as a collector road. By Norfolk County. It's designed and intended to have a higher level of traffic and that's been accounted for. It's also important in the traffic study to note that all the intersections, all the in, all the intersections and all the entrances will operate at level of service A, highest level. And that's right out to the end of the uh, application at, at 2036. Next slide, please. We meet all your standards. We'll leave it at that. And the Norfolk County uh, what are we asking for in Norfolk application? Draft plan of subdivision, 16 single family dwellings, an official plan amendment, and a zoning bylaw amendment. We are here and happy to answer your questions. Perfect. Thank you very much. Questions of Council Committee to Mr. Valley. Councillor Huffman. Thank you, Mayor Martin. Uh, through you to Mr. Valley, I have a few. Um, First off, have you ever done anything of this kind of intensification either here in Norfolk or anywhere else? I would say for th this would be one of the more intense developments that we have done for sure. Um, keeping with the times, if you'd asked me that same question a few years ago, lots of other developments would, would pop to mind, but given the uh, pressure from the province and the county's own official plan for intensification, I would say this is uh, this is unique. Now, I appreciate um, the connection to the ADUs that we discussed um, over the, the past couple of weeks, and I do understand that um, as everyone knows, I'm a big proponent for um, uh, different value price points in housing. I feel that we need to provide uh, in particular a certain age demographic a chance to get into the housing market and we need to have a group who want to downsize. My question is the traffic. I, that's a, it's a very congested area. I, I know that you're saying that with the traffic study, I just need a little bit more information from you regarding the traffic study. And can you expand upon what you mean by it be functioning at level A? Those are the first times I've heard those terms. Certainly, so our traffic impact study was completed by a firm Paradigm Transportation Solutions. They are experts in this. Uh, their report was uh, completed almost a year ago now. Um, when they do traffic analysis, and I'm not a traffic expert, that's why we hire them. When they do traffic analysis, uh, they look at congestion levels, delay times, all these kinds of things, and depending on Things like delay, when you pull up to a stoplight, how long will you have to wait until you can go through or a four-way stop? Depending on those metrics, they classify level of service A, B, C, D, and so on. So A, of course, is the highest performance that you can have, and that's, that is what they have found all the entrances to this development will have and the adjacent intersections. So even though there is you know, obviously uh, traffic being generated by the development, uh, there is a fairly low volume road today, and there's there, the the experts are telling you and us that the infrastructure that's in place there for roads is adequate, and then it can accommodate this level of traffic. I'm not an expert either in traffic, 
I, I, I hesitate to completely agree with you on that. Uh, the, especially West Church is a very narrow, narrow area. And we've had you in front of us in the past couple of weeks with another development that's going in in that area. And then we've got two on um, the north and south side of Nickel Street. So I just want to be very cognizant that that. Um, I don't want to be so enamored with the fact that we're going to have different price points that we've created a big congestion area. The other thing that concerns me is that uh, a lot of the feedback that um, I get from people directly is the amenities that um, need to kind of come along with this growth. So I do understand there's a list of uh, permitted uses and some of them are quite appealing, but what if those don't materialize? Then what then what happens? Then we now have a very intensified development area with no amenities. That concerns me greatly. What kind of proof do we have that we would get some of these amenities? Thank you, Councillor. First of all, and we're going to build in three phases, the single family homes first and then the 76 townhouses. Until we get 70% sales for the mid rises, we can't build it. So that if we don't build the, the mid rises, we won't have the commercial. So that the, they're they're part of it. You know, so so that we, we as long as we we get the sales and we think we will because of the lower priced uh, product that we're going to build, that then the 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 commercial will come with it. Thank you. I'll let some of my colleagues ask some questions now. Any other questions? Council Brown. Uh, thank you, Mayor Martin. Through you to John. John, I uh, I think I, I heard a while back with the developments happening on the west side of Waterford and our water and wastewater plants are on the east side of Waterford. Is there any, any, what's there not a, Concern with some of the infrastructure in between. Did you mention uh, a while ago was it sanitary or water that had to be upgraded? Uh, as you are aware, with all developments, um, we we provide the design flows from our development to your engineering staff. They provide those flows to your consultant, which is RV Anderson. RV Anderson then puts those into a, a computer model that they have, and they give us a report back to answer your question. Uh, we're still waiting for that report to come back from RV Anderson, but I expect there will be some upgrades uh, given the you know the size and the, of the flows that we're expecting right. here, and that would be on the water side and the sanitary side. So, I guess your developer, um, depending on what kind of feedback you get, uh, there'll be some extra costs, major costs in there. Am I correct? But there will be costs to upgrade some infrastructure. That's for sure. I should also introduce uh, Mr. Tom O'Hara to the to the group. Uh, Tom is uh, in the development group that is uh, the applicant. So on the if I can finish there. Um, you, you said that there will be some you, you you feel there will be some upgrades for water and sanitary between I guess between the two of the plants in this development. This development is fairly big and uh, we've already dealt with two other ones and I'm I thought it was the very first one we dealt with there a few weeks ago that you said there had to be an thought it was an increase in sanitary on a couple of streets going to the plant. I, I, I is that in a previous report? We dealt with uh, a subdivision on Charles Street, which was required to do some upgrades, potential upgrades. That engineering staff had not confirmed that yet through a sanitary sewer pumping station. You get that perhaps is what you're thinking of. I'm not sure. Okay. So does this, these particular this development does it run the same course or same same lines? It it actually goes a, a different direction. Okay. Um, but again, we're waiting for that report from the county's consultant to identify what upgrades would be required. Thank you, Councillor Hoffman. Thank you, Mayor Martin. Uh, through you, I think those are probably more staff questions, and just wondering if Mr. Grice is available to uh, provide some clarification on those questions from Councillor Brunton. I don't see Mr. Grice on the line, but I do see Mr. Dick out on the line.
Hey Tim, did you did you hear the question from Councillor Breton concerning um, wastewater infrastructure upgrades? Um, we are still waiting for the modeling reports to be completed by RVA. Um, for water is the major concern at this point in time with this development because the conveyance system is currently undersized. Um, we are currently investigating um, potential upgrades as well as the modeling of this development. Thank you. Mr. Dicko, could you please expand? It's, it's always a, a general thing in the public where people talk about the issues with water and you've just kind of said again, issues with water. What issues with water are you talking about? Are we talking about capacity? Are we talking about fire flow? Are we talking about um, our, our sewers? Could you expand on that, please? Uh, through the chair. Um, we highlighted quite early in the inquiry of this development that the fire flows would be of a concern because the existing water mains are currently undersized as to what they want to develop. Um, we have been having different conversations back and forth, and we are going to be, like I said, modeling it to see if what the improvements are required to increase the fire flow. So that would be conveyance. I don't believe we have any issues at the treatment facility to supply the amount of water. It's getting the water to the site. OK, thank you very much for that clarification. Councillor Columbus. With that subject, um, who covers the co who would cover the cost of this increase in the uh, sizing of the water? That's the developer. Yeah, normally uh, in Norfolk, uh, the developer would pay that cost. There is opportunity perhaps through development charges to get some credit for that or not. I don't know, but uh, the normal course is the developer. And something for council to keep in mind. Um, a developer may upgrade it, but if it's a condo corporation, then that asset does not belong to the county and do the mandate that it does not belong to the county. While we're on the subject, just to think about any other questions. I have a couple I'll post to both of you while you're up there and whoever wants to take it is fine. Um, so first and foremost is parking. Uh, it's pretty high density. And my question to you is, is there any wiggle room on removing a few units and adding in the adequate number of parking? My concern is on street parking and it's, it's just such high density that it's not, there's already enough traffic and cars there um, and we're missing 25 parking spots with that reduction with the one bedrooms. We do have two levels of underground parking, which is at a cost of about sixty, seventy thousand dollars a parking spot. Um, I believe the number is six or no, four, four hundred and some park overall parking spots. And we, all, all of the all of the towns will have parking on site, either in the garage or 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 in front. The the eight the the single family homes have three. They have two tandems as well as one in front. The only ones we're talking about re reducing are are the um, studios and the one bedrooms, who normally come with one vehicle or sometimes none. You know, and, and you know if we're we're not downtown Toronto, with downtown Toronto, a lot of their units have zero parking stalls. So we feel that that it's an adequate amount. I suppose that what's going to happen is that then if there are additional parking spots, they're going to take over those visitor spots, um, which I mean, they still have a spot in that in that case, but um, I'm just concerned because of the high density that there's going to be cars in the streets. The condo association would have to police that. You know, Mohammed was, was speaking about how we do police the on site and, you know, a lot of times with condo associations, we we partner with bylaw and and Norfolk County so that if people are are parking on uh, where they shouldn't be, that they're ticketed, and and those tickets are are treated like any other ticket and goes against a person's license. Um, you know, so so we, uh, you know, we we'll, we'll, we want to cooperate with, uh, with with Norfolk County and and certainly we've had great cooperation so far. So kudos to to Brandon and and Trisha and and. And obviously, Mohammed, certainly an overworked guy, that that uh, we, we brought this project along in in, in my cup of a heck of a hurry once we we uh, it was deemed uh, complete. Um, and I guess the other issue is that we might not have the bylaw resources as we add more 
footprint to cover that it's it's just a concern and i know especially as board counselor in fort dover prior to this rule um there's there's a condo corporation that we just simply couldn't help them uh where when it came to on street parking and um so it's fine you know here and there on occasion but it's just such an identity that it brings me a bit of concern that the ward counselor and the mayor of the day are going to get a considerable amount of, of correspondence and we might not be able to help them the condo association can can do the ticketing themselves. They have oh, condo oh, sorry, manager. I yeah. you meant no, 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 but I think it'll be an electronic situation that when tickets are, are issued, that they'd be they'd be generated and and uh, bylaw would, would be informed that these tickets have have been issued, and and that if they weren't paid, that 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 would go up against their license, so that we can't police those streets. Would that be similar to what the BIA requested for us? Would we have to designate? I don't know enough about that. Through you, Madam Mayor, we'd have to investigate further, but uh, yeah. uh, I think there's lots of examples in, in larger urban municipalities where condo corps either contract a third party to do the, the enforcement and ticketing or can, can contract with the local municipality to provide that service, but that's you know, would be worth the further discussion as this application proceeds. Or we can we can have a third party as well and be towing them if they're if they're if, you know if they're if they're there for for more than an hour two hours and then we have a contractor that comes in and just takes them away to ensure that fire lanes are respected. Okay, I guess because there's there's a lot of visitor parking there, there's flexibility. But um, unless the ward councilor wants to chime in on parking, maybe I would leave it with yourselves and our staff to further that conversation on is it third party? Is it through the condo corp? Is it our bylaw? Can you get us an extra five parking spots and you're only down 20 or 15? I don't know, but I, I want to raise that as a bit of an issue, Councillor Huffman. Thank you, Mayor Martin. Thank you for bringing that up. And that was one of the other things that we, I wanted to discuss is that I do feel that we're a little bit tight on the parking and whatever um, accommodations can be made, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, and I think we would like a, a clearer picture as to the condo corp dealing with the with the tickets. I just contacted bylaw last week for some infractions that are ex that are happening in the downtown core and basically was told I, I kind of have to wait till summer. Um, until we've got our summer students. So um, that's not quite the news that I want to hear. Um, but it's it's of concern and I don't want to have a situation where we've got a very intensified area and then things being to um, the roadway that we do have being taken up by cars parked on the road. My next question. So if I understood correctly, you're going to build out, you're going to do your pre-sales and when you get to 70%, then you're going to work on the mid-rise, which includes the commercial um, space. So you're not really in a position I mean, I, I agree with you. I don't think it's going to be a problem to to sell, but you're not in a position yet to go ahead and, and make um, commitments on who's in those commercial spaces, but you've identified some really great uses for them. And, and I want to commend you for that. I think that's wonderful. My question to you is if for some reason you're not successful in getting those particular uses, um, what can we do or what are you prepared to do or commitments are you prepared to make to to help us have um, kind of some restrictions around what it is. It's not like we're going to see a grocery store in there and then there's all this high density coming through. So what kind of commitments can you make to the public that there, there are good commercial uses that fit in the neighborhood? I mean, I hope you get what you want to get in that. I'm sure that's great. You know, I feel that you know, our goal would be to put in some some great services. And obviously we, we, we know with that, with that kind of density, we need a daycare. Um, so, so that that that's a no-brainer. Um, we, we feel that a, a restaurant is a is very appropriate. Um, you know, it, if if the if the mid-rise didn't go, I think we'd be back in front of you, Mayor Martin, and and uh, looking to do similar similar to what we're doing right now. It'd be a lot less density. You know, I, I, I think that it would it would end up being all all towns uh, or more single families. That sort of thing. So um, maybe that that that's that's the honest answer to that. Okay. Know, but and then the green space um, and then the fence daycare and so on. Can, are you able to commit that those would go ahead regardless of if the daycare goes ahead? Are you able to commit some green space? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You know, and and the day the 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 park the park will be 
be, be able to be used by the public, not not just the people there. Councilor Huffman, did I steal your quota? No, I, my question was, um, just to clarify, are we talking about the park space being the daycare play area? There's another space across the street. Okay. Across the path. There, there's there are two. There's one daycare in the fenced area. There's another area out by. You'll see three circles on on your diagram. Um, we're, there, there, what we we were going to leave three of the of the silos and use them as 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 climbing toys for the kids, but those those that uh, silos that are, are closest to the east are in such bad shape that they're actually falling apart now. Um, that we're probably going to to rebuild those with, with concrete so they'll they'll be proper climbing walls for, for youth and, and, and the adults. Okay, I have two more questions. Uh, sorry, Mayor, if, I, if I'm a minute. Uh, one would be, do you have an idea as to whether you're looking at a uh, child care centre that would be a profit-making centre or a not-for-profit centre? We haven't got that far. I, I, I don't know the full disclosure. I don't have any children. <laughs> so, um, so, so I don't, I don't, access the, the local daycares, but I, I think there's some great, my sister-in-law tells me there's there's great daycares in town. So I think that we'd be going to either health and social services or to the local daycares to see if they want more arms. Uh, but I think that we would we would lend to 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 people who are running them right now to, to let us know what what's the best manner to pursue. Okay, that's that's good direction to follow. And um, I guess my next question is, is because a lot of people in here are probably wondering, um, can you give a little bit of detail as to when, how, and if this proceeds, um, when the silos, what happens with the silos? You know, when, I, I think that we'd like to start building this fall if we could, next spring at the latest. Um, we, we we've gone to tender for the silos already because we, we feel that 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 because it's underutilized land that that we will be building something there, um, and uh, we've awarded to to a, a, a contractor. We just didn't want to supersede this process and be respectful to 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 the approval process, but they should be coming down in in September October is when we discuss with the with the uh, with the contractor and they'll be down before Christmas. And we're we're also we're also just so you know that we're 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 going to repurpose the the um, um, the the, uh, the concrete. We're going to break it down into what's called a granular B. We need quite a we need 18 inches for all of our roads and every driveway. Uh, so we'll be repurposing that. And and one of the other partners wants some of the other uh, con concrete for for some of his uh, one one of his uh, projects. Um, also, we we did complete a DSS test. And there's no asbestos in it. Um, we only found a little bit of lead in one of the other buildings, uh, so it's actually very a very clean site. Um, we also did take away the the there was a card lock uh, gas uh, gas tanks. We've already removed those. We have three minor little spots, um, and we actually drilled yesterday to to locate those spots exactly where they are. And then I'll I'll be having. Uh, the, the, the contractor that digs my basements, he's going to come over and 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 dig that uh, the the, um, the, the uh, contaminated soil in the three in three spots. They'll take that out and they'll truck it to uh, a site in London, Ontario. It's going to be one of my questions. Do you have an estimated cost on remediation on the site? <laughs> well over a million dollars. Um, the, the silos themselves, a little bit, was two hundred ninety-one thousand. That that is just the silos. That's not. There's another sixty thousand square feet of buildings. Um, the the uh, the tanks. And after we're done, it'll be over a hundred grand. Well over a hundred thousand. It, it was about twenty thousand to get the tanks out. And now just with the testing and phase one, phase two, and then to get our record of site, um, all of that will be well well over a hundred thousand. We have to take out uh, public works, or the, I forget the new name that it's called. They, they told us that they want the uh, the old pipe, old pipes that are in in um, in the ground for Old McCool Old McCool Street. Um, the pipes in. Just two gloves, that, and it that, doesn't that have mean? a, a buffer on it. Sorry. So the, the pipes that are in the ground for Old McCool, we're, we've got to take those out of the ground um, and. Uh, as well as we've got three areas of electrical that 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 uh, service land we've already we've already con are working with Hydro One to take the first portion out. 
when the bus company is done with the building around the end of this year, I'll take that portion out and there's a third portion we're taking out. So I would think somewhere 1.5 to $2 million we're done just to remediate the site. And do I understand that you are going to apply for grants and TCs? We're, we're, we're working with um, Brandon Sloan to, to, to determine if uh, this is a brownfield site. And we have a we have a draft application going. We're just waiting for the, the brownfield regulations to come out so that we can plug into it and, and see if that is, is something that, that pertains to us. Seems like such a good idea at the time to create that exemption. <laughs> um, okay, I think my last question for you is my favorite question, and maybe it's a question for Ange. Uh, accessory dwelling units. So you have a section of the development that has 16 units. Uh, I think you're calling it section A. Um, so as this council now well understands, every single one of those units could have an accessory dwelling unit in them. Are you prepared to make any commitments to council today on how many accessory dwelling units you would fully build out so they are turnkey and, and market them as such? Um, so my name is Angie O'Hara. Sorry, yeah, I'm sure I'm vertically challenged. Um, so uh, out of the 16, we would what we were looking at doing is probably minimum of four. Uh, we would like to set up model homes on the street. Um, so with each of those models, they'd be fully developed from top to bottom so that the purchasers coming through could see the concept um, and then going forward on pre-sales of the other homes, then they could decide whether or not they wanted to add it as an option for the basement to be finished within their purchase agreement. Or what we found is that if people are handy, um, you know, kind of go back to grassroots of getting the friends together and build out the basement themselves, um, then that's a great way to build up equity in a home um, rather than having to pay. That's a, labor. such a great way to do it actually as model homes, because then you can build them out to demonstrate what they could be, but you're not making an investment yourself. That's, you don't know if they're gonna all go. So you you would commit in writing to four units being completely built out turnkey, ready to go. And then you will work with the, the purchaser if they want to build others, or they can um, buy it with all the provisions ready to go and they can build it themselves if they so choose on those 16 units. Yeah. The that other thing to keep in mind as well too, and we currently, We've been having a really good relationship with Norfolk County uh, Building Inspector Department. We have some ADU units that we're currently working on and making sure that we can get them prepped to a point that even if the person doesn't want to have the basement done right away, that we're not having a homeowner go into a home and having to backtrack, try to rip stuff apart in order to get them to be ADU compliant. There's a lot that needs to be done in order for them to be ADU compliant. So obviously, even if we were selling a home, but the basement wasn't finished, um, we would be encouraging any of those purchasers to make sure that they're in contact with Darnold County um, if they were looking at building them out at any point, because there's there's a lot of, there's extra steps involved. So. That is wonderful. I would like to thank you both for making a commitment to build out some of those units and give this a go and there certainly may be more than four if, if the community is interested in in building them and purchasing them that way. But um, thank you for going the extra step and building out the four units and, and demonstrating to the development community and to purchasers that we have uh, some of these more affordable, not by definition, but actually affordable spaces available. Um, if someone wants to go and purchase a home, they correct, collect the rental income, their mortgage is impacted, just similar discussion we had last week. So thank you. Um, my only other question with that is is the parking. So I heard you talk about the tandem units and the, the three spaces on all 16 of those units for parking. So is there enough parking for you to have um, that additional one vehicle for the accessory dwelling unit in the basement? Yes, there is. There's three, there's three dedicated parking spaces for each of the 16 single family homes. Which which is is enough for for an ADU as well as the, the rest of the unit. It's so great. Thank you. One of the, one of the things that I just wanted to to bring up, Mayor Martin, is that with the silos coming down, there are 22 of the silos of the 33 that are on government of Ontario land, 
And then by the end of 2024, under contract with the, the current landowner, they have to come down. There's a lease in place. Um, and we're also you know, hearing hearing from, from passers-by the trail, I'm one of them, that some pieces are falling falling down. So, you know, con concrete has a 50-year shelf life, um, and, and they're at they're about 45 to 47 years, depending on, on, on which silo it is. And, and in, in, a, in addition to that, um, we, we um, you know, with, with the uh, with with the with the silos, um, we we uh, we've taken pictures of the art that's on the other side of it. Uh, a lot of them, as as, as Councillor Huffman knows, they um, they were done by youth, um, and so we have preserved them. We have a video of them. We have a, we have several stills of each one. We're going to create artwork, and we're going to put them into the daycare as well as a lobby of the mid rise. Um, and and if if we can in, inside the uh, inside the restaurant, uh, so we can preserve that. We've all, we've also talked to some of the local groups to see if we couldn't do fundraisers and you, use those pieces of art. Actually, they're very good. And some of some of the ki kids who did them when they were six, eight, ten years old now are twenty five, and and so that that you know we're good, we're going to give one try, try make limited edition prints and and sell them as as fundraisers in the community. Councillor Columbus. One question uh, with respect to sidewalks. Any, any comments where the sidewalks will be going? Definitely, uh, we'll have sidewalks uh, in front of the single-family homes, and then we'll 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 join up to wherever we have to. We, I know that that council's big on on ensuring that we're there's connectivity, and we'll 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 we've got we're on three streets. We're we're we'll, we'll make sure that our three streets connect to 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 the sidewalks. So. For sure, that, that'll be part of our plans. In addition, what we've also guaranteed, we're working with the trail and actually gone to, to one of the, the Heritage Trails meetings, and they're certainly in support. And we're going to repave their parking lot as well. Right now, it's not in very good shape. Um, so when, when we're doing our interior roads, that we will repave their parking lot. And I'm sure that we're going to have to repave the end of uh, Nickel Street in front of the, the uh, in, in front of the, um, the Legion, so for sure. OK, I'm not seeing any other hands for you two, so thanks for the presentation and the supplementary info. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the public. Is there anyone here in council chambers who wishes to speak to this development? Come on up to the podium, if you wouldn't mind. I believe we have a book on the podium. Oh, Casey has it at the back there, so we're going to collect everyone's name. And if you would state your name for uh, the public record. My name is Heidi Nabert. I'm a 22 year resident of Waterford. Originally from Concrete Central downtown Toronto near the uh, Farmers Market, St. Lawrence Market. Um, parking. Um, I, I wanted to mention being originally from downtown, I could go anywhere in the city without a car. Can't do it here. Found that out when um, due to a suspected um, seizure, I lost my license for six months and it took me four hours to get to Toronto using the, the transit that goes through from Simcoe up to Brantford. So to believe that somebody could live in Waterford without a car, I think is dreaming, number one. Um, if there isn't enough parking space spaces for uh, all the people that are going to be moving into this area, uh, I question whether there's going to be any available space at the Legion to park or the trail. Um, traffic's a whole other thing. Infrastructure is a huge concern of mine. I've, I've noticed in the last 22 years a difference in my water pressure. And I don't know that this is something that's really going to be uh, specific to the developers. It's probably more of a county question. Where are the schools? What's the projected population for this development? And I'm hearing about families and affordable housing. Affordable housing is designed for families. So if we look at two to three children per unit, where are these kids going to go to school? I mean, right now, I understand from the women in my yoga class who all have children 
they're being bused to Boston and Bloomsburg from Waterford when they could actually walk to the school from where they live in Waterford. So I think um, there's a whole bunch of stuff here that has not been taken into serious consideration at all. You can't just build houses and expect everything else to function properly. Uh, with that, I, I'm dying to know what the population um, of this development is projected to be. Thanks for coming today, Heidi. Um, uh, staff do have that number, and, and we t typically don't get into question and answers with our staff, but I think that they have a, a, or an estimated number. Are you, Tom, if you do off the top of your head and you want to share it? But um, I will take the opportunity to pass the buck on the housing, or sorry, on the on the school question, because uh, it's actually not a municipal decision that we get to make, and Councillor Huffman is the actual expert in that. So if you want to provide any comments to Heidi on, on how that system works, um, because we hear about it all the time. Well, the system works is that every time there's a planning development that uh, comes forward, it is forwarded it to the Board of Education. And um, for the past over four years, every time we've got a report back from the Board of Education, they've stated that there have been no concerns, which is obviously an untruth because we know that there have been concerns in the Waterford area as recently as the, um, the boundary changes that they've made to um, Waterford Public School. So the, the Board of Education has petitioned, um, the trustees have petitioned the province for new schools um, in the Waterford area. They will not um, commit to a new school until all of the schools are at 90%. So that's why that there's the movement of the, the Yin subdivision. Originally, many people maybe don't know this, um, was originally scheduled to go to the Bloomsburg um, school. And um, anyways, so now that is happening. Um, there's still capacity at Bloomsburg and there will still be some capacity at um, Waterford at uh, Boston. And then the Waterford Public School, the grade sevens and eights will be moving to the high school. And that will be freeing up apparently the, uh, there will be, uh, from my understanding, one to two, maybe no um, portables, but it's the Board of Education who this is their responsibility and I've lobbied them and I've participated in the meetings in terms of the boundary review. Thank you very much. Are there, is there anyone else? Who, sure, come on up and if you wouldn't mind stating your name for the public record. And uh, the presentations are limited at about five minutes, so I will give you a notice if you're running over and, and hit that button there on the microphone for us, please, sir. Councillors, my name is Steve Carroll, a lifelong resident of Waterford. My wife Val and I, we own several properties in Waterford, mix of residential and commercial. We totally support this proposal. We need development in Waterford uh, to sustain the existing infrastructure that we have now and provisions for the new. Uh, without tax dollars and development fees, uh, we're going to be going backwards. And uh, another point I'd like to make is the families that are moving into Waterford are uh, getting very active in the community. The Lions Club, the Lionettes, I believe, have acquired 10 new members in the last couple of years. And we need this young blood keep the system rolling because we all know what the Lions, Lionettes do. Also Pumpkin Fest, all the volunteers are, it's a whole new space and it's through this new development that uh, it's bringing it on and we all know how successful Pumpkin Fest is. That's all I have to say. That's great, thank you very much for coming. Anyone else? Come on up and state your name on the public record, please. Madam Mayor, Councillors, my name is Lori Shabak. I'm a longtime resident of the Waterford area. I grew up in the country. I lived in town for 20 years, but I've lived outside of town now for another 20 years. And uh, my situation would be better for me to be back in town in an area where I can be a participant in my own life on the trails, 
seeing life go by me and I need this um, to go through. Hopefully it goes through because it's my lifestyle that I've been looking forward to. Believe it or not, I've been talking about this to myself and my family for eight years, even before a development like this was coming to Waterford. This is how I want to live in a high rise. I'm on an acreage. I can't do it. I'm not well enough to do it, but I want to stay within my own community. I don't want to move to Brantford. I don't want to be in Simcoe. I want to be in Waterford. I want to be in my community where I grew up, where my parents went to school, where my kids went to school, where I went to school. Um, it's a wonderful community. I don't blame anyone for wanting to move to Waterford. It's amazing. We have the trail system. We have so much nature and so many things to offer, service groups, the Legion, everything. So I'm really looking forward to this project and I hope it goes through. Thanks, Lori. Would anyone else like to come up and come on up? State your name on the for the public record for us and you have five minutes as soon as you begin. Council Mayor, my name's Grant McDonald. Um, I have a few concerns, but um, I'm just gonna address one right now. And I have to side with Councillor Huffman because there makes no concept on their saying it won't be a traffic issue. Um, the exiting of that project is going to be on Church Street. To say it has two exits, Nickel Street and Church Street, is factual, but anybody who travels that area knows that Nickel Street isn't the route you're going because you're going to end up at St. At St. James and then you're going to end up in the gambit of Alice Street if you want to go that way. <laughs> so then you're going to come to Washington Street and turn right. I'd like to know how a uh, transportation study factors in hypothetically 300 cars at one point in time. I'm not just talking this development on the table. I'm talking uh, Mayberry Homes potential 32, which went to 44 townhouses, Ferrari's 24 townhouses, the new proposal on Washington for seven, 70 houses, and then the Spatafora coin development increase all of those people exit on Washington Street. Washington Street and Thompson is either going to need a three-way stop or a stoplight. Um, most mornings, you can't get through the intersection on Main Street because of the backup of Tim Hortons right out onto the road. Um, you can't turn left on Main Street on a good day in the afternoon um, because of the traffic flow. So my only question is to try and understand how the impact of traffic is not going to be happening with that many cars coming to a four way stop and then a T intersection. That's it for now. OK, thank you very much for coming and engineering uh, was on the line, so they'll be taking notes on everyone's comments. Would anyone else like to come up to the podium? Come on up. Wouldn't mind stating your name for the public record when you get up there. That would be appreciated. Good afternoon, Mayor and Councillors. My name is Pat Persley. I live on West Church Street in Waterford, and I'm concerned about the silos coming down, what the effect it's going to be on us. I have asthma, and other people have COPD, and I want to know the effects a lot and how it's going to affect us, and uh, my breathing and everything. And I'm also concerned about the people living in Waterford, the balancing. I can't go downtown and buy a bra or panties or shoes. If you have kids, you can't go down town and buy them anything. We have nothing. Um, and I think that's important. Um, we already got a lot of subdivisions in, and this is just going to make like a big rat hole, I think. And um, it's going to cause a big mess. Okay. Thank you for those comments. And uh, if anyone else would like to come up to the podium and speak. Um, sorry, it's Heidi neighbored again. Um, one thing that I'm curious about, there's still that one section of land on uh i guess it's mccool that has uh storage units um and that's industrial what's happening with that 
I mean, I think it would be kind of an eyesore to leave an industrial plot sitting there surrounded by nothing but residential. So I, I leave that with you. Thank you. Thank you. On up, sir. Hello, my name is uh, Andrew Pease. I was just kind of curious when I see that we're already pushing forward to um, develop, agree to turn this into residential land, that the uh, two developments on the uh, north and south side of Nickel Street are still empty. I did see that they were kind of cleared before necessarily going through. And like the lady said too, is how many um, residents have had an issue with the one on the south side with uh, dust and everything and all the debris flying around. So it, I do think it is a concern about what the, you know, would actually happen once you start to take those silos down. And uh, also just, yes, like I know they say, oh yes, traffic or infrastructure, water, but I know myself, my water pressure some days that you can barely use the shower even with a high efficiency shower head. So I just wonder if you're actually gonna do that, like it's easy to say, you're going to do this. I can say I worked on uh, some of you might all know Dover Coast, which is owned by a condominium corporation. I know all the promises all those people were made. I did almost every house there. I was a bricklayer and uh, in the seven years I was there, none of their concerns were ever actually met, especially when it came to water. So I just the only thing I think I'm trying to get at is it just seems a little rushed to try and go through with something when we have all these other plots that haven't even developed yet and we haven't even dealt with what's going to happen when we actually put those houses there yeah that's all i have to say Sorry. thanks for your comments we certainly hear you just um and i'm not ignoring any of the comments today what staff are taking them all down they'll they'll um, inform the subsequent staff report that does come back to us so we've got staff on the line listening in in the room here listening um and as far as development goes which council doesn't have an opportunity to prioritize um, you know, necessarily when a builder builds on other plots of land, it's something we're looking at when we give out water capacity. But at this point in time, uh, we really just have to address the files that come up, come before us. But it's a valid point. Yes. I'm answering on behalf of the development because they've already said yes, but yes. The 16 single family homes is a separate subdivision. They will they will not have condo fees. Um, there will be one or two condominiums for the remainder since it's built in phases and the townhouses may not meld with the mid rise that there may be two separate condominiums, but still that, that remains the scene. And Andrew, the 16 are on that billboard in front of you, the uh, closest to Councillor Van Passen there that, that back along McCool Street. So those are the 16 that are not. The, the contractor that we uh, the, that we awarded the demolition to for, for the for the silos, they're actually nipping them down very slowly. There's no detonation, um, so that that we're 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 told that there'd be very little disturbance to um, to 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 the neighboring houses. We've asked that person to go within 300 meters to to knock on doors just to make sure that that they don't. There, there is a heritage home and it might be yours. So if there's a person that lives on the corner of West Church and, and New McCool um, that we want to make sure that they're, it, it's, a, it's about 130, 40 year old home. We want to make sure that piece is respected. Thank you for those comments. Is there anyone else who'd like to come up to the podium and speak? Just a reminder, you need to provide a written submission or speak today to be on the public record uh, if you wish to preserve your right to appeal. OK. Thank you everyone for all of your comments. We appreciate that and it will get wrapped up into a subsequent staff report that will return to council. So with that, does a member of council wish to approve uh, the staff or pass the staff recommendation or proposed an alternative staff recommendation, Councillor Van Passen? Seconded by Councillor Barry. All in favor? Okay, thank you very much. That's carried. And we're going to move on to item 4.2, which is the proposed closure and conveyance of parts of Stevens Road unopened, Plan 461, CS 23061. Um, let's maybe give everyone a moment to clear out, and then I'll pass it over to you, Ms. Van Dyke.
Ms. Van Dyke, do you want to take it away and we'll roll right through this last one? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you to members of council, uh, Ms. Kelly Darbyshire and Ms. Lydia Harrison from our Realty Services team are here to present this report. And then we will all be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, Mayor Martin and members of council. Report CS 23-061 is being presented to the Public Hearings Committee for information purposes to allow the public an opportunity to express concerns, comments, objections, or support with regards to the request by the applicant for the permanent closure and conveyance of part of Stevens Road, Plan 461 Norfolk County, adjacent to his property. The report provides the nature of the request by the applicant, along with other related details. Realty staff did not receive any public input with regards to the proposed street closure. A further report will be presented to Council at a later date for the purposes of a decision. Staff are here today to hear from the public and to answer any questions Council members and the public may have related to the requested road closure. Thank you, and with that, we'll take any questions. Thank you, Councillor Van Andrushi. Chair, through you. Uh, when I look at the di diagram, um, the GPS diagram there, where it's indicated in the where. Um, just just by looking at it, how does the person have access to their home on that one? I just don't see the driveway. I don't see any of it. So this property is it? Is it? Oh, okay. Then okay. All right. There's covered by because I found how in the world does that person get in? I can see the driveways and all the rest, but I couldn't see it there. So anyway, I can't see it. Councillor Van Passen. Um, just to help Councillor Van and Grishy, I think this is a dated photo. Oh. And I think for a couple of years they weren't using that. And they are currently rebuilding a brand new or building a brand new cottage on that property. Okay. Is that correct? Through the mayor, uh, it appears that that's what they're doing. Yes. Oh, so I would. Okay, not a problem then, thank you. Any further questions? Does anyone wish to move staff recommendation or propose an alternative? Moved by Councillor Columbus, seconded by Councillor Barry. All in favor? Barry. Okay, with that, uh, oh, sorry, Councillor Michelli, did I miss you or were you just offering? No, Madam Mayor, I, I was just um, voting. I think there's a bit of a delay in my movement to the screen. Okay, thank you very much. With that, uh, motion to adjourn at 4.36 p.m. Moved by Councillor Huffman, seconded by Councillor Barry. All in favor? All right, go Leafs, go.